Uh, noting the presence of a quorum, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Uh, before we proceed with the agenda, there are a few preliminary procedural matters uh, requiring our attention as a commission. First, for the benefit of the audience, I note that uh, Chairman uh, Preston Bryant's seat is empty here. His term as chairman of the commission expired on January 1st, 2019. And as of yet, the president has not appointed a replacement. That being said, our general counsel has advised us that our bylaws are very specific on how we must proceed in the absence of a chairman. First, because of our statutory authority reserves that only the president has the authority to appoint the chairman, we as a commission cannot appoint someone long term to act in that capacity. Instead, our gen general counsel advises us that the bylaws require the commission to elect one of its members to perform this function at the start of each meeting, with the understanding that the vice chairman, in, in his absence, a member of the executive committee, is the likely person to be elected to run the meeting. Whereas normally this election uh, will take place in open session on a monthly basis, today it was necessary to undertake the vote in our executive session so we could proceed with the executive session that we just held. Thus, for the record, I note that in the executive session, the Commission elected me as, vi as vice chairman to run both the executive and open sessions of today's February 7th, 2019 meeting. Before we proceed with uh, the rest of the items on the agenda, however, there are two other preliminary procedural matters requiring our attention as a commission. They're both related to the absence of a chairman. And since it involves the interpretation of our governing law and bylaws, I'd like to ask our general counsel, Ms. Ann Schuyler, to address these matters. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, as I mentioned to you in executive session, NCPC's statutory authority reserves to the President the authority to appoint the Chairman. The Commission cannot appoint someone long term to act in that capacity. Instead, the Commission bylaws require the Commission as a whole to <coughs> assume the position of Chairman and perform those administrative functions normally performed by the Chairman to run the agency. Obviously, this is a very unwieldy solution, and therefore I would recommend the Commission delegate to the Vice Chairman the authority to perform those functions falling upon the entire Commission by virtue of the absence of a Chairman. From a legal perspective, it is important to note that the Vice Chairman will not be acting as Chairman. Instead, he will be performing the functions reserved to the Chairman as Vice Chairman on behalf of a delegation of authority residing in the Commission. This, the, t the tasks that we're recommending delegation include without limitation convening and running the Executive Committee meetings to set agendas, signing correspondence normally undertaken by the Chairman, such as correspondence to the Office of Management Budget, Congress, and officials of the Government of the District of Columbia, signing actions delegated to the Chairman by the Commission standing delegations, and representing the agency at meetings with high-level federal and District of Columbia officials. Before I continue with the discussion of one other preliminary, preliminary matter arising from the absence of a chairman, I would like to turn the meeting back to the commission to, attend, to, to address the issue of delegating to the vice chairman the authority to perform those administrative functions required to be performed by the commission in the absence of a chairman. Uh, accordingly, I would recommend a motion to the following effect. Move that the Commission delegate to the Vice Chairman the authority to perform these functions falling upon the entire Commission by virtue of the absence of a Commission Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I would so move. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Second? Uh, second. We have a second. Um, so uh, I think uh, all in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Um, a motion to delegate the vice chairman uh, the authority to perform these functions following upon the entire commission by virtue of the absence of that uh, has been seconded and moved and so uh, passed. Um, 
Now I believe Ms. Schuyler has further advice and recommendations on one final procedural matter. Yes, indeed. This is the last final. She's earning her pay. <laughs> um, welcome, welcome back to work, Ms. Yes. Schuyler. <laughs> it's good to be gainfully employed. <laughs> Turning to the last procedural matter, the bylaws envisioned an executive committee comprised of three members, the chairman, vice chairman, and a third member, with the caveat that one member must be a representative from the district. The executive committee is primarily responsible for setting meeting agendas. The absence of a chairman reduces the ex executive committee to only two members, Vice Chairman Gallus and Commissioner Dixon, who is in fact the district's representative. In keeping with the bylaws, I recommend that the three-member composition be retained to prevent tie votes. Accordingly, I recommend that the Vice Chairman recommend to the Commission and the Commission vote upon that recommendation, a third member of the Vice Chairman's choosing to be appointed to serve on the Executive Committee until April, when new appointments to the Executive Committee are traditionally made, or at such time as a new Chairman is appointed, whichever occurs first. Thank you, Ms. Schuyler. I'd like to nominate Commissioner May uh, to serve on the Executive Committee. He has served as a member of the Executive Committee in the past and has always done an outstanding job. His commitment and dedication to upholding the requirements and principles of the National Capital <coughs> Planning Commission have been unwavering. I have also spoken with him and he has indicated a willingness to serve. Mr. Do I hear a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move that Commissioner May be appointed to serve on the executive committee until April when new appointments to the executive committee are traditionally made or at such time as a new chairman is appointed, uh, whichever occurs first. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations, Commissioner you. May. Thank you for agreeing to rejoin the executive committee. Um, Having addressed all of these procedural matters, um, if there's no objection, the open session agenda is adopted as the order of business. Agenda item one is the report of the vice chairman. I, I'd like to start off by first uh, extending a, a, a heartfelt thanks to the NCPC staff uh, for uh, their dedication and patience during this, the extended government shutdown that uh, uh, just ended. And uh, I, I really want to congratulate you on the amazing job that you've done to get things back on track quickly. Um, I think on bef behalf of the commission, uh, we recognize the importance of the work that you do to protect the nation's capital uh, as an incredibly important asset for this country. And on behalf of the commission, I want to uh, tell you how much we value and appreciate what you do every day. So welcome back. It's very nice to see you all here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we also have some other uh, changes that have occurred uh, since we've been away. Uh, first, uh, we have several new commissioners to welcome today. Uh, mayor Bowser has advised me that Mr. Arrington Dixon will continue as a mayoral appointee to the commission for a two-year term. Arrington, as ever, thank you very much for your continuing service on the commission. Wouldn't be the same without you. Um, in addition, uh, Mayor Bowser has also appointed Miss Linda Argo uh, as a new mayoral appointee. Welcome, Miss Argo, uh, to the commission. Uh, we look forward to working with you and lots of productive and exciting topics to discuss here. You're, you're going to love it here. <laughs> See? See? <laughs> We're passionate. That's the um, In addition, uh, I want to just mention that uh, Mr. Michael Rhodes, one of the alternates of the Secretary of Defense, has retired after 34 years of public service. Mr. Uh, Sajil Ahmed is here today as the Secretary of Defense's alternate. Welcome, Commissioner Ahmed. Ahmed or Ahmed? Ahmed. Thank you. And as we welcome new people, so too we're saying goodbye. Um, there are two resolutions uh, that have that will be have been prepared, uh, recognizing the service of Commissioner Jeff Griffiths and Commissioner Michael Rhodes. Uh, 
I'd like to take a moment to provide some highlights of these resolutions that are at each of your uh, stations. Uh, Jeff Griffiths was appointed to the commission by Mayor Muriel Bowser in 2015 and served uh, as a commissioner for four years. Beginning to bring to bear his development experience and knowledge of the district community and planning issues, he has, he has been an enthusiastic supporter of our efforts to revitalize and reconnect the, East, East, the Southwest Eco District and Southwest Waterfront to the National Mall. He was a strong voice on the commission for efforts to ensure federal development proposals supported neighborhood goals. Commissioner Griffiths looked for every opportunity to bring federal and local interests together in support of shared stewardship of the national of the capital city. And we certainly thank him for his service on this commission. We will miss him. Also, Mr. Mike Rhodes was appointed as an alternate by Secretary of Defense Robert Gates on April 10th, 2009, serving over nine years on this commission. He consistently advanced the commission's review of the Department of Defense facilities and inst installations in the National Capital Region, using his knowledge of NCPC policies and interests to promote effective design solutions that also address community and regional issues, particularly at the new Intelligence Community Campus in Bethesda. Commissioner Rhodes provided thoughtful, balanced perspectives to NCPC's work, especially where we sought to achieve design and security goals. He furthered NCPC's relationships across the National Capital Region by holding an annual meeting with the leaders of the military installations and facilities to promote better understanding of our goals and activities, and resulting in new partnerships and improved procedures. I also want to recognize his 34 years of distinguished public service with the Department of Defense, culminating as the Director of Administration and Management. The Commission would like to recognize and thank both uh, Mr. Jeff Griffiths and Mr. Michael Rhodes for their years of valued service as Commissioners. We wish them much happiness and success in their future endeavors, and we will certainly miss them. With the Commission's concurrence, these resolutions will be sent to Jeff and Mike. Okay, so moving on then to agenda item four in the report is the report of the Executive Director, Mr. Acosta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome Commissioner Ar um, Argo to uh, NCPC. Also congratulate uh, Mr. Dixon for his continued uh, service to NCPC, and also thank uh, Commissioners Rhodes and Griffiths uh, for their work. They've always been very supportive of the staff and the work of the Commission. Uh, we're pleased today to give you a quick preview of our 2018 uh, Digital Annual Report, and that's on the screen in front of you, and will be available on our website. Well, the report highlights our key accomplishments this year in plan review, our comp plan update, as well as our other agency initiatives. And this will be distributed next week, and you'll find that on our website at ncpc.gov. And then finally, I'd also like to thank the staff uh, for their perseverance uh, during the uh, furlough period, and also for the hard work uh, that they've done over the past, uh, past few weeks uh, to get us ready for today's meeting. And that concludes my presentation. And you all have a copy of my written report in front of you. Thank you, uh, Director Costa. I, I think this really represents an, an amazing amount of uh, work and accomplishments over the last year. So congratulations on your leadership and thanks to everyone at NCPC for accomplishments. Um, agenda item five is a legislative ups, update. So Ms. Schuyler, once again. <laughs> Am I becoming boring? And no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I have two, quick, two, two items I would like to report on, and I'll try to be quick. Um, the first is two bills, one in the House and one in the Senate, have been introduced uh, to establish the Adams Memorial Commission, who in turn is authorized to establish a memorial to honor John Adams and his legacy. 
You have heard about this before. It passed the House last session, but was not able to proceed through the Senate. Both versions in the House and the Senate are identical. The Commission will work to establish um, a memorial. It will be retained in um, area, to, it, it will be in area one, but not in the reserve. And um, it will be subject to the uh, Commitment of Works Act. The second is a bill with the, yes, ma'am. Is this the one for the the entire family? Yes. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to know. It's, if it's, it's professional. It's uh, John Adams and his legacy, which includes his wife, son, and other family okay. members. Okay. Um, that particular bill, by the way, has gone to gone to committee in the House, and it's actually been placed on the legislative agenda of the Senate, and will be dealt with in the Senate in the order in which it appears on the legislative agenda. Um, the second bill, H.R. 47, has a horrifically long and incomprehensible name, so I will only say to you it's a bill to establish a monument in the District of Columbia to as a tribute to the women's suffrage uh, seven-decade effort to pass the 19th, 19th Amendment, which granted women the right to vote. Um, it states a preferred location in Area 2 near the Belmont Paul National Monument in the Supreme Court, and it also, unlike most bills, contains detailed design specifications. I would look for some changes perhaps in this as it moves forward. Um, it will be subject to, um, to the requirements of the, of, the Kinetic, of the Commandment of Works Act, and it was introduced on the 10th of January and referred to committee. Wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Schuyler. I think we they were celebrating that a little bit the other night at the State yes, of the Union. Were. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, thank you. So there is one consent calendar item on this month's agenda. <coughs> Uh, the General Services Administration has submitted preliminary and final building plans for antenna installations at the Theodore Roosevelt Building located at 1900 E Street Northwest. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? Um, Mr. Chairman, I would move to approve the consent calendar, but I have one comment to make as well. Go right ahead, sir. Okay. So um, I just want to say I appreciate the diligence with which GSA and uh, NCPC staff are approaching how we handle these rooftop antenna installations because we all know they're not very attractive. And it's a difficult thing to try to assess uh, and to try to play, you know, balance that uh, play between the effectiveness of the technology that's being deployed with making it um, not be a blemish on the on the buildings um, and where we can control it on federal buildings. We want to make it look as good as possible. So I appreciate all of that effort. So, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for um, uh, a motion. And can I have a second? Second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Mission is care. The, uh, and thank you, Mr. Motion May. Is care. Yes, we thank you for upholding, carrying the flag for us on this issue consistently. Um, first on the open session is agenda item 7A, to approve the final site development plans for the South Capitol Street Corridor and Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge Park landscape design, submitted by the District Department of Transportation. Mr. Fliss will provide us with an overview of this important project. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, members of the commission. The District Department of Transportation has submitted the final site and landscape plans for the South Capitol Street uh, corridor uh, for your review. Uh, you may recall the commission has reviewed this project at a preliminary level uh, for the Landscape Act last July uh, with some big comments that were to be addressed uh, before this final review. Uh, since then, DDOT has continued to work with staff um, to uh, respond to these comments. Um, I'll also note that the bridge itself was separately reviewed and approved by the Commission back in April of last year. So just as background, uh, South Capitol Street is an important corridor within the district and it's a link between the main axis of the, the U.S. Capitol building uh, heading south and Suitland Parkway, um, and that's shown here on this image. Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge originally opened in 1950, and it provides this important crossing um, at the Anacostia River, linking a number of district neighborhoods. So as you know, the project <coughs> includes two major components. First, the Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge, um, and then the South Capitol Street corridor improvements. The bridge, which is shown here, includes a uh, triple arched form uh, with six travel lanes for vehicles, 
and then also dedicated bike and pedestrian paths on either side, along with four, uh, four overlooks, which are two on either side. Again, this is what was approved last year. In July of 2018, um, you also had some additional discussion about the pedestrian and bicycle, bicycle circulation on and approaching the bridge. So as a reminder, we had some discussion at that time about other contemporary bridges and the proposed widths of the pathways that um, were being provided. Uh, the, uh, the commission requested that at that time that after the bridge is done and completed and in operation, that DDOT continue to evaluate whether additional changes might, might, mean, might be necessary uh, for pedestrian and bicycle operations and to report back on that in the future. Regarding access to the ovals, um, the speed limits and the uh, circles are proposed to be around 15 miles an hour uh, with 25 miles per hour for the approaches. So this is a relatively slow network. DDOT also indicated that the pedestrian crossings are all signalized um, and timed with the lights um, to accommodate access to these public spaces. So moving on to the landscape, which is the focus of today's uh, presentation, I'm going to talk about a few of the components that were uh, the focus of your previous comments, and then also the changes that the applicant has made. These include the programming of the East Oval and the Esplanade, uh, the views and framing of the West Oval, <coughs> details related to lighting and signage, and then finally, the inclusion of interpretive elements which were related to the life of Frederick Douglass. So the proposed ovals uh, on both sides of the river, the bridge and the esplanades create this uh, experiential sequence for travelers, uh, residents, and visitors, both entering and departing the Monument of Corps as well as uh, the Anacostia neighborhood. I'm going to focus first by talking about the East Oval. So this area is uh, surrounded by open spaces and low density development. It borders Poplar Point, which is to the north and controlled by the National Park Service as well as Joint Base Anacostia Bowling, which is to the south. Portions of Poplar Point and also nearby Howard Road could redevelop in the future, um, and this is kind of closer to the existing metro station. This site provides um, an opportunity to develop a larger scale local memorial or public art uh, to create its dramatic gateway to the bridge, and also coming south towards Anacostia because it's not in a competition with that direct line of sight to the U.S. Capitol. The Eastern Oval, uh, which is shown here in the Esplanade along the river, uh, provide a series of paths and open spaces that connect from the riverfront down south towards the uh, surrounding neighborhoods. It's also the first opportunity in the series of park spaces that frame the bridge itself. So previously the commission had uh, made a few recommendations. First was to incorporate additional trees and plantings where possible to help buffer pedestrians uh, from the noise and views of the traffic in this area, particularly at the south end of the oval. The applicant has continued to develop the landscape plan to provide a variety of plantings uh, and also to create a more ecological friendly approach. So for example, um, a butterfly garden shown here as well as some other bioretention areas have been added to the south uh, to the south end of the oval, um, and additional plantings are provided in this area. As I've noted previously, the site still has the potential to be the location of an important gateway element, um, so there is uh, uh, still open areas and lawn provided um, in, within the oval to allow that to the, occur in the future. Pedestrian paths and other gathering areas are also provided. Uh, again, these help link the riverfront, the esplanade, and then areas uh, moving south towards the Anacostia neighborhood. The, pre the commission previously recommended the applicant consider uh, some additional opportunities for interpretation and programming, and this is to help serve as an amenity for the surrounding community. Um, in response, DDOT has included a series of diagrams and studies um, that show how the Esplanade and East Oval and also the surrounding areas could be used for a variety of passive and active, activity, uh, uh, active activities. Um, so this example uh, shown here, um, with uh, south is actually to the top of the image, so this is rotated a little bit from a typical view, shows some of those kinds of activities that could occur on a typical day. Um, and these include picnicking or outdoor classrooms, uh, just, just as an example. And so here's a different uh, diagram. Again, this is showing the potential for weekend, ev uh, weekend events. This include, uh, could include more uh, program sporting activities, farmers markets, things like that. I'll also note that new gathering areas have been added, as well as a performance space and an amphitheater on the Esplanade. This is shown here in this uh, rendering. Um, again, these are places that are intended to help engage the community. 
So in general, this side of the project is much larger um, as a component of the overall project, and it could support a significant range of activities um, at a variety of scales from these smaller pop-up events to larger gatherings. I'll also note that some of these diagrams show the use of um, National Park Service land, which is Anacostia Park. Um, and we do think that it might be appropriate to incorporate some uh, events and activities into these uh, adjacent areas. But we do recommend that the Commission request that the District continue to work with the National Park Service regarding the use of any adjacent federal lands um, for such events and activities. So moving on now, this is the West Oval, um, and this again affords that direct view to the U.S. Capitol. Uh, this area is changing uh, with a, a lot of development going on. In particular, it's anchored by a National Stadium, which is located to the northeast, and the recently completed um, Audi Field, uh, the D.C. United Stadium, and Buzzard Point. So previously, the Commission had requested the applicant consider some additional trees and plantings, uh, particularly at the southern end of the oval. Um, this would help improve the setting for any future uh, memorial or public art and also help reinforce that connection uh, between the bridge and the West Oval. Staff had also noted at that time that while the other sides of the oval, the east and west and, and northern portions, were clearly defined through the planting approach, uh, the southern end was much more diffuse. Improving the southern end um, and also the landscape in general would help provide that, that visual terminus at the southern end of the oval and also would help connect the oval to the bridge. So in response, uh, the DDOT has provided additional trees and plantings at the southern end of the oval. Um, this helps terminate that uh, view from the, from the U.S. Capitol and also helps to pivot your, your view shed towards the bridge, which you can see here on the uh, left side of this image. Overall, we do think this is a, an improve, uh, improvement to the design. The interior of the oval uh, remains a lawn area that's flexible and would allow for different uh, types of programming, including the potential for a future uh, art element or memorial. Um, we do think that this openness, again, preserves those views to the U.S. Capitol and is appropriate. Um, we don't think that any additional trees or plantings are necessary here, and there, therefore we recommend that the Commission support retaining this as an open area uh, with views towards the Capitol um, and also as a potential site for a future memorial or, or piece of art. So a preliminary review, the Commission had also requested some additional information regarding lighting, uh, signage, and then also how elements regarding the uh, cultural legacy of Frederick Douglass would be incorporated into the project. Um, the applicant has provided some additional uh, information regarding these topics. In general, the signage is generally functional and consistent with district standards, uh, and this is the same for uh, roadway lighting, which um, includes the use of Washington Globe and teardrop streetlights. Within, within the ovals themselves, DDOT has stated that um, they will use uh, standard upright poles along the pedestrian pass, um, and this is shown in these diagrams here. Uh, overall, we think this lighting uh, may be appropriate, but we do recommend that DDOT continue to evaluate uh, the lighting levels to make sure, uh, particularly for the ovals and esplanades, to make sure they're appropriate for pedestrian safety and, and uh, movement, uh, particularly considering the setting and also the surrounding context. <coughs> And then finally, uh, four interp interpretive plaques have been integrated into the bridge um, in those uh, overlooks that I mentioned earlier. These plaques uh, speak to the various aspects of Frederick Douglass's legacy. Each includes a, a quote and a rendering that talks about his life and also the surrounding setting. Overall, uh, we do approach this integration um, of these elements into the bridge, uh, uh, particularly given its namesake. And while other locations have been uh, identified for interpretation, including along the river and esplanades, uh, we do feel that the Belvedere's provide prominent locations, uh, uh, particularly along those pedestrian and bicycle paths. And they also benefit from those expansive views that you're going to get from, from the top of the bridge deck, looking out over the Anacostia. So you can see here some of those renderings um, of, of all those different interpretive elements. And then here you can see an enlarged, enlarged view of one of the plaques um, that talks about uh, Douglas's life. So overall, the proposed plans have been improved, um, and the applicant has worked with uh, NCPC staff to address the previous comments. We understand that DDOT continues also to work with the community um, as the project advances through construction. And therefore, it is the executive director's recommendation that the commission approve the final plans for the South Capitol Street Corridor landscape and the site improvements. 
notes that opportunities for interpretation and programming have ident been identified for the East Oval. Um, requests that the district continue to coordinate with the National Park Service uh, regarding any uh, use of any adjacent federal lands. Uh, notes that trees and plantings have been added um, at the south end of the West Oval per the Commission's request. Supports retaining the center of the West Oval as an open lawn and potential site for future memorial or public art. Recommends that DDOT continue to evaluate uh, lighting levels. Notes that white lighting is appropriate for the bridge itself and that DDOT should continue to work with stakeholders regarding uh, lighting displays. Notes that if any changes are made to the, to the design, they should be submitted to the Commission for review. And uh, that concludes my presentation. We have representatives from DDOT uh, as well as their design team here to help answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fliss. Um, wondering if anyone has any questions or needs further enlightenment here. Commissioner Argo? Oh, I was looking at oh Commissioner Gantz. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I, I think that the designs look great. One of the things that, that really struck me as I was uh, contemplating this when I was rereading it this week is kind of the really different feel that the two circles have. I feel like the East Circle is in a very different context. It's almost part of that park system that's running along over there. And the West Circle is much more of an urban kind of park feel that, that's anticipated. And I said the last time this was before us that I think the programming will be really important here. And I know if this is for um, for for OP to take back to the city, but I think that, that one of the risks we run here is if this becomes a DDOT thing and DDOT continues to maintain this, I worry that the programming won't happen. That's not really what they do. And I'd suggested last time maybe looking to like a DPR type thing um, or even, I mean, this is in the bid down there and I, hopefully they could do some stuff, but um, the, the East, or I'm sorry, the West Oval really reminds me of in downtown Detroit where I'm from Detroit. There's a, a, actually a, an oval like this called Campus Martis. And I mean, it's always a ton of programming going on. It's really an anchor to downtown there. There's food trucks, there's all kinds of stuff always going on. It's a traffic oval just like this. So I just really wanna encourage the district to kind of be forward looking and not just let this become a DDOT tract of grass that just kind of sits there and doesn't get engaged. And hopefully that we can really think about programming to activate that area down there. So, so I just wanted to point that out. But I think that, that the, I'm glad that the suggestions were taken and I think that things look great. Thank you. Mr. May. Uh, so I, I have a few comments, um, and just following up on the, the nature of that space and the future of it, uh, there is already development, there are development plans for what could happen along Howard Road. Um, that is very much contingent, I think, on, on uh, finding tenants for those developments, but um, if that starts to happen, I think that will uh, drive some substantial change in, in that area. And then, of course, um, just because we need to remind folks from time to time that the Congress did say that Poplar Point itself should be transferred to the district and uh, gave guidelines on its future development. So it will eventually, of the 101 acres roughly, um, 30 or so will wind up being developed fairly intensely once that planning process gets kicked off again. and. It's been ongoing since the uh, D.C. Federal Lands Act of 2006, so it's a long time in the making. Hopefully there'll be some new energy behind that. Maybe this can actually help trigger some of that because I think it will help with that area. Along the same lines, the, um, if you can bring up slide number 13 or 12 or whatever, one of those that show the activity on the north side. So um, I just want to point out that everything that's uh, in that, uh, uh, to the left of the bridge itself, that whole island of space, that is all still currently uh, Park Service land. It's part of what would be transferred. Um, some of what is being suggested here may not work um, in that location until uh, some future date anyway because of that transfer because you know, we wouldn't necessarily permit um, some of the things that have been pictured. But um, we do appreciate the fact that the, the city is thinking in those terms uh, in, in terms of encouraging activity in that area and have been working closely with our staff at National Capital Parks East. Um, so I just wanted to flag that for people's information. Um, I, I also I had a one small question which had to do with the, um, uh, the treatment of the surfaces under the bridge. Uh, and specifically, it looks like there's a, a, a loose gravel or a crushed stone treatment on the levee walkway. 
Yeah, and so uh, my question is, I, I, I maybe I, it was a, in the presentation materials that I received in advance, but I missed it. But um, is that intended to be somehow a continuation of the Anacostia Riverwalk Trail, and would it transition to a a crushed stone surface? Because that's I believe it is a continuation, but it is not just the crushed stone; it's actually on like a structural yeah uh, grid. Um, so it's not intended to be a loose material. So it's not loose. So it's. It's, but I can all defer to the. There's the a binder or something in it that keeps it solid. What's well, in it? It's nodding, but I, maybe somebody needs to actually come to the mic and answer that. The reason I'm concerned is that it's just you know, crushed stone is not a a good cycling service surface. And the <laughs> I'm not just about cycling, but. And you can't afford to break another leg. That's right. <laughs> that didn't happen in cycling. That was volleyball. All right. <laughs> Please introduce yourself. Sure. My name is Alan Harwood with AECOM. Um, we're the uh, landscape architects and urban designers for the bridge project. Um, it is a crushed stone surface, but there will be a binder so that it's fixed. We don't want any uh, erosion into the river as well as any loose surfaces for people that are walking on the, right. the pathway. Uh, it's really to get people out up on the levee so they can see the water because the right. Anacostia Drive is below the levee and you can't see the water. Right. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, it, I, I, I like the idea of it, the purpose of it, and, and even developing some understanding that it actually is a levy is a, is a good thing too because not pe people are not aware of the levy structures that we have around the city and mm -hmm. having uh, that understanding is a good thing. But um, I, you know, the, the, the Anacostia Reward Trail does get um, cycling traffic and I wouldn't want it to be um, there to be a, a problem area within it. So as so long as it's, um, there's a binder and it's solid, I think that's okay. Um, the last question I have is one for staff, which is that the um, reading through the and the uh, CFA recommendations, uh, there there is a a oddly worded conditional final approval uh, and request that certain additional materials be submitted. I think for just staff review. I think that was what was stated right, in your report. Yeah. But it's the you know. Uh, sometimes I need a CFA interpreter uh, when I read their letters to understand what it means, and I get letters from them all the time. Um, the uh, but I, I guess what I'm concerned about is is there any possibility that uh, changes that may come out of those dis further discussions with CFA would actually have to come back here um, for further approvals or modification? I mean, of if there was a substantial change, we would ask that they submit it. It may not be a full open session discussion, yeah. but. Um, we've laid out in the staff report our position. Uh, I think there were comments about uh, particularly adding trees to the oval, the west oval, which I've discussed in our presentation. I don't think NCPC staff is supportive of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I understand that DDOT will continue to talk with CFA staff to uh, address whatever comments they might have. They may, yeah, I can't speak for them how it will be resolved, but I think we've laid out our position and from the staff perspective that's in the EDR. And, Okay. That's where we want it to head. Yeah, and I have no qualms with that. Um, perhaps, um, again, a representative of the team wants to address the how things have gone with CFA, because I think the last approval was from November, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was last fall. Yeah, so presumably there were some further discussions. Is there any, been anything, any further progress? Who's delegating to staff? Yeah. Yeah, hi. So, um, uh, the, we did get approval from, from CFA, and they identified a couple of, uh, of issues, particularly the trees in the, yeah. the south end of the West Oval. Uh, and that primarily arose from the desire to see the capital from the Oval. And we prepared a long section that shows that you can see it even without raising a mound and, and um, landscaping it with trees. Uh, if you put the trees in, then it, the ground cover wouldn't, wouldn't grow, so you'd have another plaza that would compete with the North End Plaza. Uh, so. Um, the, the secretary of the CFA agrees that, that that's probably not necessary, um, and I think that's what we've conveyed to staff here. Um, <coughs> that was the primary issue that they had. Uh, they also had some concerns about the Belvedere um, as the pr appropriate location for the interpretation. They thought maybe it should be under the bridge, and we didn't agree with that either. Um, and, and for the consultation with the community as well, that the Belvedere's are really the, the more prominent and more appropriate location. So if I were to summarize, I so, would say 
I mean, is it, it sounds like things are going okay with the staff review, and so, are you expecting a final final from so approval we, from the we, secretary? So we got final approval from from the commission formally, I understand and then th that. these were things for for follow up with the staff. Right, the staff is is has uh, agreed to these changes, and and um, uh, so it, you know things have proceeded well, and we feel like we're in, in good stead with them. Okay. So when I get a delegated approval to staff, we typically close it out with a further submission, and then we get a final, final letter from staff indicating that they've approved that. Have you gotten that yet? No, because the, the wording of the, in the decipher, the decoder of CFA, yeah. it was considered uh, looking at these things. It wasn't uh, a requirement for the approval. It wasn't a, a conditional approval. So the staff has indicated that no further final approval right. is needed. That's right. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Trueblood. Thank you, Chairman. I just want to um, reiterate, I think, what, what Mr. Cash said, which is it's clear that, that programming is, is going to be critical on this. And in some ways, uh, I worry that that's even harder than, than the design element um, in terms of, of, of making these ovals successful. Um, so I guess I have, I have two comments. Um, and whether or not they speak to specifically the landscaping, I, I leave to you. But um, on the south side, I agree. It, it's at least for now very. Um, it, it it's it's much more park ne, ne, park like, um, and and I I wonder. I didn't see in any of the the diagrams there um, any vending or retailer opportunities for people for refreshments, uh, which I think could be um, uh, just something to consider, especially if you're you're starting to talk about it in relationship to Anacostia Park. Um, and I also think that that can help, depending on where it is and how it works, could, could enliven some of that space. Um, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 north, um, the north one is, is interesting. I think it both has a great opportunity for um, lots of vibrancy, but also because of where it is in these two kind of connecting these two neighborhoods. But I'd also, I also worry it could just be kind of a cross through. Um, between Nats Park and and uh, Audi Field, so um, I just you know I think there is a lot of thought that we have to all put into it uh, into in terms of how we um, make these what what the the what everyone envisions them and and in terms of what the the renderings show, which are I think relatively vibrant with lots of people in them. Thank you. Any other commissioner yeah. Dix? Yes, Mr. Chairman. First of all, uh, uh, I'd like to find out from, I guess, DDOT, the level, the participation, the community participation, how is it going, and and is it, uh, obviously it's been somewhat fruitful because of the changes, but has it been a successful effort as far as you, an ongoing effort? Okay. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Joe Dorsey, Deputy Project Manager, and thank you for that question, Commissioner. Yes, um, we have engaged with the uh, referring communities, the ANC commissioners, and that's what uh, has evolved from the today's, uh, I guess, redesign, if you will. Okay. I'm taking into account several night meetings. Uh, we meet with uh, the staff. We have a uh, Frederick Douglass quarterly commissions meeting where we meet every quarterly with various stakeholders. We also meet with the, um, the ANC members monthly. So we attend their meetings to give them updates on their respective uh, project changes. And then we also invite them to come to the project office uh, during the evening when the office, when the hours permit to come and get updates and to give input on various uh, opportunities within a project. Very good. I'm encouraged by that, and I'm glad you're doing it. Uh, and thank you. I do have some questions. I guess I'm not sure who to direct them to, but I want to make one general comment about the development of Popular Point as it comes to us. I hope that we are not too overly aggressive. I don't want us, those of, those of us who live, I am very live very close to this, I don't, we're not competing with the other side of the river in terms of density, and I hope that there will be some effort. I know the Park Service is going to try to keep it as green as possible, but so we would not like to, we're not trying to create a corridor here with things high on both sides. And I think everyone probably knows that. Uh, I also would still love the idea, it's kind of old and behind me, that maybe it could be a great university presence there to have a, some presence of the University of District of Columbia there that could focus on the environment and all the things that relate to rivers that need to be cleaned up. But that's maybe not part of this discussion. Uh, I want to go also back back to the specific discussion about the East, east uh, Oval, uh, there was mention of lighting on the other side. Is there going to be, and I don't know who speaks of this, any lighting on this side uh, 
which also is a safety issue and a usage issue. Any lighting yes. of other side? Yes, um, and we showed that in the um, image here. We actually talked with them about both ovals and they are providing lighting on those paths. Uh, okay, particularly well, because staff had a question about the safety and yep. you know functionality of these paths. So they are included, yes. Well, I'm encouraged if the community is involved with that, I'm sure the lighting will be will be Absolutely. fine. Absolutely. I just wanted to be sure. Also, I'm not clear on how the bike pass from Suitland bike path, which needs to got how does that connect to how it rode into the bridge? Is that is, I'm sure it's there, but I'm not clear on how to particularly with the traffic issues that were we mentioned earlier, how does that bike path work? So here's a, a diagram showing all the connections, and there's there's quite a few. So you have the east oval here. Yeah. Um, there's a path on the outside of the oval, and then also on the inside, which connects down here to Howard Road. Yeah. And then the metro station is here. Um, and so and so the tra the bike path would of course have to cross traffic at some point. Yeah, it's a signalized intersection. If you if you cut through the the oval. Yes. If you stay on the perimeter, then then you don't have to cross traffic. That's great. Cause I'm warming up my bike, and uh, <laughs> I, I can walk it. In, like it's only two miles from my house, but I can ride it faster. So yeah. Good. Now I know it's connected. I That's tried great. Biking out here a couple <laughs> weeks ago, and it was tough. So. My balance is not what it used to be, but I'm working on it. Um, the other thing I, I was uh, concerned about is the under the bridge, and I'm not. The surface is obviously an issue that Peter raised, but. I noticed the Navy Yard is talking about building walls for flood around its structure, which is going to have an impact on my walkway from the 11th Street Bridge to the this Frederick Douglass Bridge. I'm assuming that. I hope it doesn't break it or stop it. Are we considering anything about floods as as relates to the east side, east oval, as we build this bridge and we have the focus on the on the pathways and all this nice. Are we, is there any, any focus on the, on the possible flooding issue yeah. that we need to, I mean, I can't, is, I can't speak to that. Uh, so did you want to talk to the I mean, I don't know if it's too late or would make sense to elevate that, that pathway. The bridge may not accommodate it, so we can at least try to keep some of the water. Some we want on the, in the, on the park for a reason, but is anybody can, can focus, has anybody focused on the, that yes, issue? Yes, sir. So it's behind the levee, so it has been accounted for. Yes. There's a 14-foot, I think, offset. On the east oval, from the from the north end to the south end, yeah, I don't know that, that that has been accounted for. Does that deal with the hundred years, a thousand years, or what is it? Year. Hundred year, I believe. Is Every year, years? well, that, that takes care of my concern. Hundred years, okay, I guess. <laughs> 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 they uh, the other thing is there's been there was one time some discussion of the uh, Douglas uh, Gardens as something that would be uh, a presence present on the east side. And it seems to me that this oval, East Oval, could accommodate that kind of a naming, which I guess is in the hands of the city, at some point to give a, get another Douglas, and maybe recognition of Douglas on our side of the river as well, since we have a home there, et cetera, and the bridges. So I'm hoping that'll come up, maybe in come, some of the community discussions. It, it actually has. Um, uh, some of the commissioners have asked for the processes to start, you know, petitioning for naming rights and, and things of that nature. So yes, sir, we are exploring those well, opportunities. Well, that's very good. I appreciate it. That. Uh, I got a lot of um, ongoing concerns. I just am very excited about it. Okay. I can see myself sitting in one of those places, not on this side, the other side. But uh, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Wright. I have a couple of questions. Um, um, I, uh, what's the, I'm, I, I, I have the scale, but only comparative. What's the dimension um, east to west of the grass panel in the west oval. Some point. Close, just a guess. Okay. Um, so, um, and the other question is, how will this? Um, I I see the materials and all that, but the the how will this the star shape be expressed in the north end of the panel? So I, I'm confused. Are there seat walls that are around this thing, or <clears throat> what, Alan? Yeah. <laughs> so I just talk to you, or just come here? <laughs> yes, there, there are seat walls around it. it, it it's kind of there are um, walls that that kind of undulate because it, it's kind of taking the arch of the bridge and kind of extending that to the landscape. Um, the star shape is actually uh, each of those kind of the star flowers is what we refer to it is the the uh, shape of the arch. Then in mirror, that's that's what the shape is inside of the the uh, plaza. 
then it's surrounded by undulating walls where people can sit on. So it's a, and it's intended to be a very active place. Um, someone had mentioned earlier about connecting the two stadia. Um, it's the kind of place where you would have the pre-game or post-game concert or, or rally session. You know, so it, it's supposed to be a, a real active hard Right, skate. so that's why I'm asking about the particulars here because it's, a, it's lovely in plan, but it's hard to tell how it, uh, so I still don't get it. I get that there's seat walls around the, uh, separating the gravel or what are these paths, but the, the edge of the star shape is going to be what? Is it going so to So there, there's an image, um, it was in the, the uh, report, I'm not sure if it was in the presentation, I don't recall. Well, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of things, it's just that they, I, I, th there's a concrete seat wall with planting, and I'm assuming that that's what it is, but I don't want to assume anything. Yeah, so it's a it's a low, about 18 inch to 20 inch seat wall, yeah. uh, and then it, at times it, it also uh, kind of gradually tapers down to, to So flush. what's inside the star then? Is oh, that going to oh, be so planted? The, oh, so in the center of the, no, that's going to be hardscape. It's going to be um, granite paper. So you're going to sit on the seat wall, and there's and that's the active the and active area. And and inside the surface uh, of the star, the the will that be gravel or something? No, that that'll be uh, granite pavers. Do we have that image? It was yeah, page we'll, thirty-one we'll see, of the report. Yeah, I mean, I'm just having a hard time reading sure. this slide, the, the a, material palette slide. Twenty-nine. Yeah. We we called it it's twenty-nine. 29. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's. I I guess I get it. Um. The, the reason I'm asking is because it, it, uh, uh, we don't have a side-by-side -side of last time, but my recollection is more hardscape in the northern part. Have you reduced it? We have reduced it in size, yeah. yes, but the, but the center of the plaza is still a hardscape. It's meant right. to be the gathering place. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, okay. Um, Mr. Wright, here's the event. That's the slide I'm looking yeah. at, and I just find it's still. Okay, so, and then, then I, illustratively, of two slides beyond that, this is an image of that plaza. You can see uh, Nationals Park in the, in the background. We make that yeah. a little larger. Uh, but so it, it's framed by seating walls on the north, north and northeast and northwest sides, and then open to the lawn on the south side. But, and, and now you think that I'm going to shake you down now, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> I have no idea what you're going to do. <laughs> Good thing. I, I actually think it's so much better. I was trying to figure oh, out why the West Oval. Um, it feels a lot less. I felt like it was cla claustrophobic last time, but I'm having, I can't remember why. And when I looked at the little side by side we had, um, it just seems, I, with except for the addition of the of the um, trees on the south, which I think helps a lot. Um, I mean, because you have to thread the needle between making people feel like they're closed in too much, but also not in the middle of the Indianapolis Speedway. So I think you've hit the right note. Great, thank you. Um, and I and the distinction that that Mr. Cash noted between the east and the west, I think, is entirely appropriate. Um, um, I still prefer the East Oval and, and, and would probably rather spend time there, but that's just because it's a little bit different from our usual fare in Washington with very formal parks, et cetera. So, surprised you, didn't I? You always do. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Joe, I had another question. Yes, Commissioner. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. infrastructure on these uh, ovals, will they be uh, for future use if necessary? Uh, if like electrical and plumbing, any any of that being built in, so that there is some need for lighting and and and, and plumbing, maybe even a maybe a re maybe a bathroom or whatever. Is that being built under built in now, as as far as we know? So so for so for the water and sewer part, yes, sir. And what about electrical? Electrical, we so it's underground, and we have to put cables in the air. For, for, yeah, just for I'm sorry, just for the street lights. Just for street lights, but Correct. that will allow other electrical. Connections if needed, I'm if assuming. Needed. Correct. Just have to power up some place. Correct. Okay. And, and tap to it. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. That's great. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I had one minor question. Mr. Fliss, maybe you could answer. You you mentioned two things in your presentation. One, that the, tra the uh, 
uh, traffic speed in the circle when you were mostly talking about the east side, you th I think was 15 miles an hour. For, is that for both circles? It's 15. For both. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and you mentioned also that you tried to navigate that by bus uh, by bike recently and not so easy, right? right. And and I of course hopefully this is going to improve that of, of course, um, but I think I'm just skeptical about it also because uh, it's going to be a real challenge. Uh, we don't want to see. Uh, cars winning the battle between bikes and pedestrians, but we need to calm it down. But part of that for me is what is the speed limit crossing the bridge, if anyone knows that? Because uh, I think it's this notion of your, your highway ties as you're crossing the bridge, and then how are we going to calm it as we come to either side? So, so, so the uh, the speed limit across the bridge is 20, 25 miles per hour, okay. and, and the thought process is with the the geometry of the ovals that would help as tra as traffic calming to kind of warn folks that they are entering a corridor. So, mm -hmm. yes, sir. Yeah, and I think if you yeah, let's hope this these are well populated places by bikes and pedestrians and. If you're that lone person out there doing it on your own, it's not so friendly, you know, in terms of trying to challenge that crossing. So uh, I know we've got signalized intersections as well, which which will also help that. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, any final comments, questions? Uh, then uh, can I entertain a motion to approve the final site development plan for this project? Second. Second. Uh, are there, uh, in, please uh, signify your favor by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Night. Thank you for the work. Appreciate your listening, responding. Okay. Next on the open open session is agenda item seven B, uh, the preliminary site development plans for the National World War One Memorial submitted by the National Park Service. Mr. Fliss will again provide an overview of the evolution of the preliminary design of this important war memorial. Thank you, Mr. Fliss. Thank you. Um, as you've mentioned, this is the uh, preliminary site and memorial review for the National World War I Memorial. Um, the World War I Memorial, uh, the World War I Centennial Commission is the project sponsor, uh, working with the National Park Service, and they were responsible for planning, developing, and executing programs, projects, and activities to commemorate the centennial of the end of World War I. Um, NCPC has provided comments on the concept designs for this memorial um, starting back in November of 2016, in July of 2017, and most recently in October of 2018, so several times. So as a reminder, Congress has designated Pershing Park in Washington, D.C. as a national World War I memorial. A two-stage uh, competition was held to select the memorial designer, and the winning design called The Weight of Sacrifice by Joseph Weichar and sculptor Sabin Howard was selected by the World War I Centennial Commission. So just as a refresher, Pershing Park is located in downtown Washington. Uh, it's bounded by Pennsylvania Avenue on the north and south and 15th and 14th Streets to the west and east, and that's uh, shown here highlighted in yellow. The park is located um, in an important civic and symbolic uh, corridor, uh, clearly linking the White House with the U.S. Capitol. Um, that's highlighted here in orange. The park is also within the Nash uh, Pennsylvania Avenue National Historic Site. Uh, this is an area of numerous historic and cultural resources, as well as within a growing downtown Washington. So here's a more recent image of the park. Uh, the site is surrounded on the north by commercial uses, including uh, several hotels, uh, parks and open spaces, including the Sherman Memorial and Freedom Plaza, located to the west and the east, respectively. Um, and then there are also civic uses, including the Commerce Building and the Wilson Building, which are located to the south. In 1979, the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation uh, commissioned uh, landscape architect Paul Friedberg um, to help design Pershing Park. And this is an image here uh, back when it was, uh, when it initially opened in the 1980s. Under Friedberg, the park was uh, reimagined as a shaded refuge with a waterfall and sunken water feature. Um, the park design reflected an idea about a seclusion from the surrounding uh, busy streets. A memorial to General Pershing uh, was also integrated into the park plan. 
This is a view again for, uh, of the park looking towards the west with the water feature and then also the western terrace. The park was dedicated in 1981 and was uh, recently determined to be eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. So going back to October, uh, which was the last time the commission saw the project, um, this was the applicant's preferred design. Um, it included a standalone um, memorial uh, wall, commemorative wall, located here in the western end of the restored pool. Um, the original park waterfall was removed, and that area was expanded as some additional terraced um, steps. The freestanding wall included a sculptural narrative on the east side um, with a potential inscription on the west side. Um, there was also the uh, introduction of a U-shaped uh, pedestrian circulation in front of the wall. Uh, you'll recall that the um, commission previously reviewed other iterations that had a much larger and wider wall, but this was reduced down by about uh, 10 feet or so. So for today's presentation, I'm going to focus on a few components uh, related to some changes that have occurred since last October. Um, and these are related to improving the design of the freestanding wall, uh, particularly as the commission pointed out that it needed to engage visitors from all sides. Improving the water feature and also that walkway approach um, to, to, the, um, to the memorial, uh, to the wall, uh, particularly given the different climatic conditions throughout the year. Also enhancing that sense of entry from the southern side of the park and then also how this um, design will help an, uh, animate and enhance this uh, space as an urban park that can engage all visitors. So before I go into the details, I'm just going to uh, note that the applicant has been thinking further about really the commemorative experience um, and um, how it applies to the landscape. There are three major components that they've highlighted in terms of, of, of the park, uh, the commemoration, including General Pershing, which is ex the existing memorial, um, and his uh, role as a great leader, the soldier's journey and experience, and particularly how this lays out in the new commemorative wall, and then finally how um, the search, per search for peace is also integrated into this uh, design. All of these are linked by the interpretive area, which is uh, located at the former site of the gazebo. So the sculptural elements of the memorial wall have uh, continued to be developed. Um, here you can see uh, the design from October, and this is um, starting to show you some of the, the detail changes that are occurring. Um, the memorial sponsor um, can certainly talk about the detail and the thought process and a lot of the history and background that they have uh, uh, continued to research in, in defining some of these details. So here's a, a view of that same wall. This is looking a little bit from an oblique uh, perspective. Previously, the commission, as I mentioned, found that this freestanding wall created a clear front and a back, and that in particular the back, um, the space at the back of the wall wasn't yet fully developed or defined. The commission requested the applicant provide some alternative design strategies to help treat this memorial element in a more unified way, uh, particularly so that it, visitors could engage from, from all, all, all the sides. So in response, the applicant has further developed uh, both faces of the wall. The east side, uh, which is shown here, uh, continues to retain that sculptural narrative, um, which speaks to the history of World War I. Uh, and again, the composition of these figures and the elements has continued to be refined. The western side of the wall has also been updated. Um, this includes now a monolithic granite finish, uh, which is somewhat reminiscent of the original uh, site fountain. And it also includes a continuous flow of water, um, shown here. Over, this, over the side of the wall, and this is intended to provide sound and movement. Um, and then in, in addition, a quote uh, related to a referencing the search for peace is also shown as well. As I mentioned, the existing water feature would be removed, uh, the waterfall would be removed, but this area would be expanded uh, with steps and seating so that it could function as a gathering space uh, and more contemplative space. Overall, we do think that the proposed treatment of the western face of the memorial wall has improved. Um, the treatment is more reminiscent of the original Pershing Park Fountain, um, and they've shown, showing some images here of that analysis. Uh, at the same time, the quotation regarding the search for peace, uh, we do think will provide a counterpoint to the wartime imagery, and also the narrative found on the other side of the, of the wall. Overall, the space uh, does appear to function as more contemplative, uh, particularly when that water feature is operating. 
as the design is finalized, uh, we do think there's an uh, additional opportunity to think about how the wall and the memorial elements will be expressed at night. Um, as such, we do recommend the commission request that the applicant include a lighting scheme for the memorial that addresses um, all sides of the wall. Uh, and in particular, we think this nighttime experience could be quite powerful. So as you recall, and I mentioned, the proposed design uh, restores that central plaza and the pool and also adds a pedestrian path. Uh, previously, you had seen this U-shaped path, which was the applicant's uh, preferred design. It included deeper water around the perimeter and then the use of a thin uh, scrim of water in the middle. Um, to better, better understand this design, um, the commission had requested in October that the applicant um, describe how the water feature in the plaza could be used throughout the year, particularly given that there's not a lot of shade um, and it could be very hot in the summer and, and cold in the winter. So just as a reminder, here's that U-shaped uh, scheme again in plan with the deeper water around the perimeter and then that scrim feature in the middle. Here's a rendering um, showing that, that same configuration. Again, from, this is from back in October. However, after some further review and discussions, uh, the applicant has developed another pathway uh, design that is now their preferred approach, and this is highlighted here on the right side. This island approach uh, includes a central platform <coughs> with a single uh, connection to the existing um, plaza. Uh, this is shown here, again, deeper water around the perimeter with the use of a scrim of water in the middle. So here you can see that again in plan view. So in this design, it does allow, again, the deeper water to encircle the platform here. Um, and also helps to reinforce that original footprint of the, the uh, Freeburg pool. We do think this is a good approach, again, as it does reinforce this edge uh, of the original pool and also appears more as a deliberative and contemporary insertion into the historic park fabric. So here you can see, again, this, this proposed design uh, in perspective. Again, the deeper water will now work completely surround this platform with the scrim in the middle. And so uh, one of the options with the scrim is if it's not in use, that this space could actually be used for events. Um, however, given the amount of hardscape, particularly when it's not in use and there are not activities occurring, uh, we do think that the applicant should consider some different paving colors and types to help differentiate the scrim area and the pedestrian circulation. Um, this could help minimize solar heat gain and also reflectivity given the lack of shade. Um, overall, the intent is to not make this look like a large and monolithic um, space, particularly in the summer when it will be hot. Uh, I'll also note that the applicant has continued to work with the Park Service regarding uh, safety and fall protection. Uh, you remember there was a discussion about how do you treat some of these edges when you have a water condition and people are circulating. Um, the applicant has provided some additional details regarding the walkway and scrim edge, uh, which you can see here. Um, what is being proposed is now a, um, a curb, a wide curb. Um, as well as a tactile edge that will surround this area to help provide that perceptible change that will help um, uh, provide that level of protection. So we've, as we've discussed in the past, um, the project design should accommodate the memorial program, uh, but also uh, help support a successful urban park. Supporting park activities is critical to the success of the site. And this is evidenced by nearby other urban examples, such as the Navy Memorial, which functions both as a, both as a commemorative space, but also as an active uh, urban space. Given its location in a thriving downtown on Pennsylvania Avenue near other important civic sites, this memorial does have the opportunity to engage a variety of visitors um, and also be a destination for residents, office workers, as well as uh, tourists and others, if it's designed appropriately. So given that, the commission in October requested the applicant provide some additional information about how the site would function as an urban park, uh, as well as potential programming or activities that could occur here. Uh, this request sought to first understand where the park activities could occur on the site, and then also secondly to understand what park uses might be reasonable and appropriate near the memorial, uh, particularly from the applicant's perspective. This is particularly pertinent given the recent adoption of the parks and open space element, which you'll remember from back in December, which talked about and provided policies related to rehabilitating and improving parks <coughs> while balancing park uses and the commemorative elements. 
So in response to the Commission's request, the applicant has provided a series of diagrams and renderings that demonstrate how the park space could be used for a variety of activities and events. These range from passive day-to-day -day activities, such as eating lunch or reading, when the park, reading within the park. And these are things that, that happen even today, it's shown here. To programmed events and special exhibits, uh, which also could occur on the site. And so here you can see that they have highlighted some areas for both uh, fixed, existing fixed benches, but also flexible, movable chairs, and areas for um, more flexible programming. So the pool platform and the precinct around General Pershing, which are highlighted here, uh, would remain the primary commemorative spaces. In addition, as I mentioned, several zones are identified for seating, kind of around that area. And then at the northeast corner of the site here, um, a plaza area has been identified for other uh, special exhibits or activities. Uh, we do think this is appropriate because this is the one area where the um, plaza is essentially at the same level as the street, and so it's a way to help engage uh, people who are passing by. Um, and we think this space uh, could hold and, and uh, successfully be a, an opportunity for events either related to the memorial or even to general um, just urban life. So as such, we do recommend support for programming the park for temporary events, both related to the memorial, but also for other park uses that would be an opportunity to attract users to the site. Finally, the commission had previously discussed uh, the views and visibility to the park uh, from the south. Um, as, you, as you'll remember that there was concerns about the, the berm and that visibility uh, on that south side. And so the commission requested the applicant consider some design options to help address this issue, particularly from the southeast and southwest corners of the site. We do recognize that the berms and the sense of enclosure are important components of the park's original uh, historic design. However, we do recognize the change in context and the need to create a park that will attract visitors. Uh, and enhancing pedestrian access is obviously an important part of that. So in response to this request, the applicant has considered a number of ideas uh, related to enhancing the southern approach. These include enhanced vegetation as well as the use of entry signage. Um, and you can see here some of the um, analysis and design options that they've kind of gone through to explore those options. So here you can see some proposed locations for new signs and markers, uh, which do not exist today. And then overall, staff does believe that simple horizontal uh, signage, which is uh, shown here, is appropriate for the site and helps highlight some of these entry points um, for the memorial. These in combination with some distinct and colorful plantings um, will also help uh, demark these entry points. And therefore, we recommend the commission support this simple horizontal signage, um, along with the accent plantings, as a way to help highlight the pedestrian entrances particularly for the southeast and southwest corners of the site. I'll just mention that as with the previous design, the gazebo is going to be used as an interpretive area. Um, and then also a flagstaff and inscription will be incorporated into the western portion of the site. Um, the commission had previously indicated that the commemorative element should largely be limited to the memorial wall, kiosk area, and the existing Pershing Memorial to help highlight their importance and to allow for these other types of park uses to happen. The applicant has continued to evaluate the potential for other inscriptions and other features throughout the site. And in general, staff finds that the commemorative experience can be strengthened by limiting the number of these elements. As I've mentioned previously, this is also supported by some of the new policies in the open space, parks and open space element. As such, staff does recommend the commission reiterate its previous recommendation regarding this issue. Past reviews have also noted the existing Pershing walls were hard to read. Um, the commission had uh, expressed support for improving their legibility. Uh, given this, the National Park Service has re recently re refinished the uh, text uh, on the Pershing walls, which you can see here. They are actually greatly improved, and some of you may recall this from the tour that you had uh, two or three years ago. Um, as such, we do recommend the uh, commending the National Park Service for these improvements which have uh, greatly enhanced their legibility and are consistent with the Commission's request. Overall, the park and memorial design uh, has changed substantially since the competition uh, selection in 2016. The proposal has continued to focus on restoring and rehabilitating the park while accommodating the memorial program. 
Overall, we do think that the design will help improve the park, and we think it will be beneficial to the Pennsylvania Avenue corridor, um, as well as the surrounding area. Given this uh, and the design revision, staff recommends the commission approve the preliminary memorial and site development plans for the National World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C., including a freestanding wall with integrated fountain, a plaza with pool, scrim, and the island walkway, the west face of the wall uh, comprised of a monolithic granite with an inscription, and the east face consisting of a cantilevered uh, sculpture. As I conclude, I'll also mention that the Commission of Fine Arts has approved the concept for design for this general scheme with uh, additional comments um, that, that they have provided, which are included in the EDR. So therefore, the executive director's recommendation that the commission approve the preliminary site and memorial plans finds that the treatment of the wall has improved and the sides reflect different aspects of the wartime experience finds the space between the western steps, uh, terrace steps in the wall can function as a contemplative space, particularly when the water feature is operating, requests that the applicant develop a lighting scheme for the memorial. Regarding the pool and walkway, supports the island walkway as it reinforces the footprint of the original pool and is a clear contemporary insertion. Recommends the applicant consider different paving colors to help reduce heating and reflectivity in this space. Notes that they have continued, the applicant has continued to work on details for safety and accessibility. Supports the simple horizontal signage and accent, plan, uh, accent plannings to help en enhance entry points. Supports programming the park for temporary events, both related to the memorial and other park uses. Reiterates support for limiting the commemorative elements to the wall kiosk area and the existing Pershing Memorial to help highlight their importance. Commends uh, the National Park Service for recent improvements to the legibility of the Pershing walls. And, uh, and, and overall, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, we also have representatives from the World War I Centennial Commission here, uh, as well as their design team. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fliss. Uh, who wants to get I started? I just have a question. Commissioner Wright. Um, is the, uh, it's probably in here, but it's easier to ask. Are the, the inscription on the west wall on the back of the fountain are those what kind of letters are those i'm assuming that they're um they're like the existing walls but just want to confirm that they're they're talking about the granite yeah so the well whether the granite. they're pin i doubt right. you're they're pin mounted but i just want to make sure because they have to interact with the water and i'm assuming you're calibrating the speed of the water so that the inscription is still legible, but I have to ask. Yes. <clears throat> so my name is David Elliott. I'm director of design the Land Collective. Um, the lettering actually is pinned. It is. It is pinned. And the intent is that the, the lettering will be projecting in front of the wall so the okay. water cascades behind okay. the lettering. So well, it's that's, not it's, so I, okay. Good. That's a good answer. Yeah. All right. I, know, I have other comments, but no more questions. So go ahead. Um, why don't you go ahead okay. with your comments? Um, well, I don't have a lot to say. Um, cause <coughs> I, I actually think, as far as I'm concerned, the things that were bugging me are all fixed. Um, especially, you know, the, I, I, I think the walkway is the thing that was still bothering me because it felt like the runway for the Miss Universe pageant and, and felt like it was going to be implicitly hurrying you along as you entered on the left, saw the thing and felt pushed because of the runway to, to make room and be considerate if it's crowded or what have you. This feels less compulsory that you have to get in and get out and, and do your business in a hurry. Um, and I'm assuming the same level of care will be um, in, it, taken in designing the, the scrim because that's going to be hard to do. You don't have a bubbler in the middle. How do you do that? I'm just curious. <clears throat> so With in, such a small, relatively small space. Yeah, too. so in concept, it's an open joint paving system right. where the scrim is. Yeah. So the water will just well up. It'll from just above, rise up. Create a film above the paving and then back down as needed. <clears throat> and then my last question really, or not, I'm sure you, you're, I know you've been working on this. Um, I just can't imagine that 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 you're going to be allowed to not have 
so, um, some kind of barrier to the two-foot pool because a kid can drown in four inches of water, right? I mean, what code... I'm asking now because I prefer it with the way you have it designed. But in the final analysis, who gets who decides whether or not this is safe? And I'm looking at Mr. May because I'm sure you've spent plenty of time on this. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it is the Park Service's decision about it. I mean, we don't it is. we don't have to go to any other code authority for this. Well, that's good. It is only 18 inches. It has a curb that's designed to keep wheelchairs and and strollers from making their way in accidentally. And um, we are, I mean, we understand that it is possible for somebody to, to uh, trip into it, but given the depth of it, um, we're not, you know, it's not like tripping and falling into uh, the tidal basin where there is not a rail over most of that length. Okay. So. Well, that was my question about the code authority. So it's yeah. your call to make. Yeah. Yeah, I mean we've been we've been thinking about it very carefully, and uh, park staff have been supportive of the approach that's being used here, and and that's ultimately what it comes down to. That's it. Okay. Anyone else, Mr. Cash? Uh, so I really want I really want to thank the team for making this work. When I first saw this project, I think that I'd mentioned that this has turned from. A, a new design competition to essentially a rehabilitation of an urban park type situation. I think that, and I was worried that it, it couldn't work, but I think that you've really made it work. But that being said, I think that the essential part of this design is that that scrim has to be on as often as possible. The pool has to be filled with water. And if we kind of get sold a bill of goods here where this is what it's going to look like and then we have problems in a year and we don't have the money to fix it, then we're kind of back to square one and it's almost as if we shouldn't have done any of it at all. So I just really want to make sure that, that these systems are going to work, that the water's going to work. Um, mentioning water, I think that the addition of the water to the wall is actually a great thing. It removes my worry about the west side being kind of just very, yeah. I mean, <laughs> dead. Yeah. <clears throat> like a little bit of water there, mosquitoes coming up. I think that, that getting the moving water is much more reminiscent of the wall that's back there now. And I mean, it, it kind of like, it, I mean, the, just the sound of the water, I think, makes it more contemplative. Um, so I just really want to put out there that the water is really what makes or breaks this whole thing. Um, I want to thank the designers for really looking at that, changing the kiosk into a Belvedere. When I first saw that they were just thinking, like, maybe just stick a, a flagpole there or something, I think that that some good thought went into that, and I think that it's really added a lot to the, the design. Um, and with the south side, I know that, that former Director Shaw and I always used to push on this and saying that it would be great if there could be something more happening on the south side because there's, there's not really an opportunity for another entrance. Um, and the entrances that are there just kind of looks like a big berm. But I actually think that the landscaping that was included in this design, with, especially with the poppies, I think that that actually can bring some excitement over there and the poppies actually have a good association with with the the theme so i think that making sure that 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 kind of planting can happen on that south side serves to to activate it a little bit more even if we can't really provide a lot more access um i did have a question actually um because it wasn't really addressed in here i noticed in all the renderings the lights have all been taken out and changed so right now most of the kind of the lights within the the park area they're these really tall um, it was actually on slide five. You can see what the current lights are. It's these really weird tall lights with like 10 or 12 bulbs on them each. And it looks like in all of the renderings that all of those lights have gone away and it's just kind of these new, much more subdued lights, which I think can look great, but um, I like you all the way back. But it's, it's these really weird looking lights now. They're much more contemporary lights that are proposed to go in, but are, is there concern going back to the design and preserving what the design of this was that that those lights aren't one of the historic elements of, of the area and that they can come out. And then we also have the mushroom lamp lights in there. And it's just, I just wanted to, to make sure that we're not kind of going to run into a problem with that, with the historic aspects. Yeah, I mean, uh, some of the of the uh, original lights will be restored or replicated, but there, some of them are going to be replaced. Um, I think we're getting rid of the tall ones with all of the globes on them because they're, they're very hard to maintain. They're... Um, And they're, you know, they, they don't meet our sort of current standards for where the light would actually go, because we want the light to be going down and not, you know, up and into the trees in every direction, even even if we can keep them lit. 
And uh, not to mention the fact that they're not the most attractive feature of the park. Um, but that's, that's okay. I think that's pretty much it. Is there anything else that we need to add to that? No. Okay. Yeah, so just going back to early on in this process, we started talking about like what was kind of the sacred cows in the original design. I just want to make sure everyone, but I agree that the right, ones aren't right. that great. I mean, um, and my last question, and this is going to be a, a question of interaction with the city, but I still worry on the Pennsylvania Avenue side that now that this is going to be more of a memorial, right now that area of sidewalk is essentially people, taxi drivers standing around waiting for a, a fare across the street. And it, I don't think that it's necessarily compatible with now that this is more of a memorial, um, just having a taxi stand along there and, and kind of just folks wandering around waiting. So is there, are you going to try and work with the city to change that? Are you concerned about the current uses of that side? I mean, it's like tour buses and taxi stands right now. Um, I don't know that we've had that much specific discussion about that. I mean, most, I mean, frankly, thinking about that side of the avenue where it's, it's part of the, the Pennsylvania Avenue initiative discussion that we've been having, having, and it fits into that. And I think in the long run, it's probably not just going to be a, a taxi stand. Um, but on the other hand, you know, having people there on a regular basis um, isn't necessarily a bad thing. So, um, I mean, so long as it's, you know, there isn't bad behavior that goes along with it, I think we're happy to have people present at that place. And, you know, it'll be nice for them, too, to have a place to sit and a nicer place to be. And cab drivers are people, too. <laughs> <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> Other Comments, Commissioner yep. Dixon. Mr. Chairman, I uh, first of all, I guess like everyone, I appreciate what's being done, and we have come some distance on this, and it's great. Uh, I also want to just comment that the the water element. I think we all we all like water for all good reasons, and I'm sure it's going to find uses that we can anticipate that but didn't necessarily program in, <laughs> particularly with the trees protecting that area. I mean, it's going to be a lot of kids that are going to have a lot of fun. I believe. And I think that's good. Sometimes your feet need to be cooled off, I guess. Um, the other thing, but I wanted to ask a little about the uh, historical uh, commemoration, I guess. Are we, have we gotten to that point yet, or is what we see what we're going to get is in this effort in terms of historical recognition of people participating in the, world, in the war? Hi, my name is Libby O'Connell. I'm an American historian, and I'm also on the World War I. I'm one of the commissioners on the... World Good. War One Centennial well. Commission. And right now I'm deep into the interpretation of this park. And I think that actually what we're developing is really one of the exciting components of this park um, in two ways. And if I may, I'm just going to approach the... Maybe give take, you a pointer. Take the microphone. Oh, the, here. Look at this. It's not historical, but it no. doesn't work. That's it, the mic. That's the mic. Her. No, so. no, no, it's not. Really it has. It's it a doesn't pointer. Work on this. Oh, it doesn't work on that. Very well. Yeah. I'm just going to talk. <laughs> you take the mic. Yeah. I can do this. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, okay, so this is only going to be one component of the interpretation that we're going to be providing at the park itself. Right. This is a memorial park at the Belvedere, which is going to be built where the kiosk stands now. We're going to have points that offer view sheds towards the General Pershing statue, offer a view, view towards the memorial wall, but also are instructive about top line information about World War I itself. When we, talk, when we say the great man view of history, we're not saying Pershing was himself a great man. We're saying it's top down mm -hmm. history. That's the traditional way we've been taught American history, certainly about our wars. The wall on the other hand, tells bottom-up history. And from my point of view, that's where the I really get engaged, but it's all good. Um, one of the things that I think one of the great opportunities that this sculpture itself offers is that it tells a universal story mm -hmm. of a soldier leaving home, marching into war with his comrades, the horror and violence of war, the return home, and the then turning to the next generation. That's a universal story. It's been depicted in bas relief for, for millennia. But what's, I think, an interesting component here, and just sort of as an example of what 
how to answer some of your questions, is the details of this wall are going to be the difference between a universal story and what really makes this about World War I. And I'm going to draw out three examples. One is that there are going to be women in uniform in this wall. World War I is, one of, is the first war where American women are serving in uniform, the professionalization of women not only um, working in the military services but also as nurses. Women have always worked during war, but this is the first war where they're professionalized, they're wearing uniforms. Second thing is it tells a story of the role of African American soldiers. There were 370,000 African American soldiers who were enlisted during World War I. 200,000 of them went to Europe. Our country at this time was at one of its you know, peaks of racism and segregation. The white officers, general who were American, said, we don't want to command these African American troops, and sent them over. The French said, we'll take them. We want them. And in fact, they served with great heroism and, and valiant action. Um, but one thing to point out is that the, one of the, the African American troop here, he's wearing a French helmet. And it's very distinctive. But that indicates, right, with that little detail, this guy was under French command, not American command, although he was American. The other detail that I wanted to point out is that the gas masks, which were originally around the shoulder, like a shoulder bag, were actually worn here, right around the neck. Well, because there was a chance that gas, poison gas, could be fired at you at any moment. You can't have it around, wait, you know, like digging for your cell phone, ladies, with your shoulder bag? That would be me. You know, it's there someplace. No, you have to have it right here to be able to pull it up into your face. So I think those three give you a sense of how we're using the details of this memorial sculpture, but also details about other aspects of the war and, and the peace process to really engage all different types of people in the history of this park. We welcome people to use it as a green urban space where they can find resonance and, and quiet with the great background of splashing water, but we also welcome them to, develop, to delve into this learning process and understand why the memorial brings a new sense of the importance and impact and really transformational aspects of World War I along with the green space. I can see that you're an excited historian <laughs> and probably I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're a teacher too because you Absolutely. took that mic and stepped right out there. And that's great. And, and you touched upon one of the areas I wanted to get into, that's the black right. involvement in this. Right. And it was brought to my attention by uh, former council member Charlene Jarvis, a council chair and member, and her husband, who was evidently a historical buff on this issue of blacks in the military. Mm -hmm. In fact, I just bought a book that I gave to a member of the staff about it. But it, it was brought to my attention that, was it, 369th? Yeah. These were the French guys. The people, yes, one, they of, went, one of them. They yeah. went before yeah. the war was actually declared, I think, here in the United States. That's what I was told. Well, not the 369th, but there were African-American soldiers who went and joined the French before. Before. Yeah. And they stayed after the war was over. Yeah. Some remained there, of course, permanently, I guess, yeah. for good reasons, all reasons. Yeah. So uh, I just think that that's, you know, and I understand that they didn't have uniforms when they went there. The, well, there's a lot, there's a lot the of history there. Yeah, there's Is a there lot going to be history. any effort other than sparking people's attention and getting them to be interested of any kind of audio oh, or any sure. kind of presentation? Oh, sure. We're going to have audio, and we will be having an app that's being developed. We've yes, been good. funded by the Mellon Foundation, Northrop Grumman, and the Walmart Foundation yes. to develop this. We'll also have points, sort of like QR codes. Are you familiar yes, with yes, that? Yes, yes. Where you can find less, um, more information about different specific topics that will lead in a very clear, simple way to branching depth of information on a specific topic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Other questions or comments? Uh, I actually had a quick question. Please, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about, uh, because I, um, I haven't, this is my first meeting, so my introduction to this as well, and I don't have the history, but I think one of the things that struck me also was making sure that there was the, on the other side of the wall, that there was a quotation um, related to peace and the search for peace, which I think, I think that, that, that element is 
Uh, I mean, it's wonderful, and um, it wouldn't necessarily be what what you would expect. But I'm curious how you pick the quote. We've spent a lot of time reading quotes. We've opened, okay. um, <laughs> and one of our commissioners who is dedicated to quotes has put, put together a whole multi-page assortment of, of quotes we've met. We've actually narrowed it down. We have a very good idea of what quotes that we will have. But the, the, the point, you know, really, this isn't the piece to end all peace. This was the piece that ended all. I mean, the, it wasn't the war to end all wars. It was the piece to end all peace because the Versailles Treaty was so flawed. This gives us a chance to think about peace as a process and an ongoing exactly. endeavor. Thank you. I, I have a couple of questions and observations that um, I, I, in my, I, there's a lot that I like about this. And, and I think the commissioners have heard me say before that my grandfather was one of those bottom up guys. He was a, a wounded a veteran in World War One, so this is very dear to me, and I'm excited about your energy and the and the evolution of this design. So there's a lot I like about it. Um, my concerns are always just really about access, really from the west, and and sort of the northwest, and also uh, the south. So maybe one of the areas, like okay, there there. So the the northwest access, as I understand it. There's going to be a normalized stair with regular risers that, that comes down from that top left corner into the space. Is that right? Is that this, what that? This is all relatively at grade. It's, that's at grade. Not, yeah, because this is the high end of the site. So when I looked at the, I don't know, you don't have it in this, but when I looked at the package you sent us uh, on page 30, it was the applicant's preferred combination from December of 18. And uh, in there, there's clearly a staircase in that corner. So maybe I'm, maybe it's closer to the wall that I'm thinking about. Yeah, there, there is a, I mean, this is all stairs here, right? All right. Um, there's a stair down here. Okay. I will note, in terms of access, they are integrating a ramp here. Okay. To help facilitate that connection from the different levels. So you will have a, an, an accessible route from that level. The same thing is occurring down here. There will be an accessible route so that these various levels actually will be connected in a way that they're not fully connected today. OK. Um, so then, I, you know, now let's, let's just talk about the seating um, on the south, right? So. This, this indicates some sort of a green, I think it's called understory planting that was referred to earlier, um, page 32, I think. Um, and so it's not really all green, right? It's seeding with planters just like it is today. Is that sort of it? So the, sorry, the southern stepped terraces? And the western are basically remaining as they exist today. I see. In their configuration. Yeah, that's that's what I was afraid you'd say. Yeah. I, um, it's this been something that I've been very disappointed about because I can't. Maybe if you could go to any of the renderings, looking at that, looking to the south. Okay. So my question is, how do you get to that seating? I see that it's passive seating. Uh, but the seating is not a regular, like regularized set of risers and stairs. It's sort of very steep um, and small. Um, and so it, it doesn't ever seem to be as inviting as your drawings would indicate to me. Um, and so how do you get to it? So when it comes to this component of the project, as the project as a whole, it was how do we insert some of these memorial um, elements into the park while maintaining the historic character, which had been kind of one of the parameters? So those are staying in the same proportion as they are right now. And yeah. they aren't designed for necessarily seating. They are more step-like than seat-like in their character, but they can function in that regard. Yeah. Um, and in terms of access, you know, it's kind of how it, the current condition is the way it is going to remain. 
In terms of the accessibility, what we have done, we have widened ramps that exist to support today's code. We have reduced the slope to today's code, so we've improved the existing connections that are there today, mm -hmm. but the Western and the Southern are basically remaining as are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know. Sorry? Yes. If it might help Please. you at all, I mean, I, I worked downtown in this area um, back when the park was very young, maybe not when it first opened, but within a couple of years. And it was a very popular spot to be there and to be sitting on the terraces there and having lunch or having a conversation. It was a respite from the rest of the city. It was a cooler place uh, because of the water. So I think that once we re-enliven the entire park, I think we're going to have people all over that area. Now, that doesn't necessarily help if somebody has disabilities and wants to get to it, but we can't necessarily address that in its entirety either. So try to make up for that in other areas. But I'm, I'm very confident that that's going to be very well used when, it's, when the park is restored. Yeah, I wasn't so concerned about disabilities because I do recognize that I think you have addressed accessibility here in a, in a good way. Um, I, I was concerned about normal people who might think of those as stairs and they think of part of why we have sort of standard stair risers and, and, and treads is because people get they're used to that rhythm and we move in that direction universally. This is not that. And I know it's not meant to be a stair. It's not meant to be a seat, you're saying, even though it, I'm reading passive seating, you know, in the presentation. It's, it's sort of not meant to be we don't know what, okay? Uh, but it, um, and I, I appreciate that it could be a very inviting place. I just feel, frankly, the more people it attracts in, on those sides, the more I'm nervous about it. Uh, I recognize there's a historical aspect to this, and you're trying to thread the needle. I get it. Um, but um, we're, we're also trying to improve uh, and make more usable and inviting uh, an important uh, memorial and urban park. And um, I think that if, if this were today and we were designing this, it wouldn't be the way it is. Um, so uh, unfortunately, uh, I feel like maybe the hands are tied a little bit about addressing this because it's, quote, historical, even though it's not great in that regard. Just my opinion. Um, but I understand that there may be limitations. Let me see if there is anything else I have. And then the, um, the understory planning, I think, Matthew, could you go to 32, please? I love the signage, by the way. I think it's a great improvement. So this is, this is I'm not sure what this it was telling me. I, I really stared at this um, exhibit, and I don't know what it's saying. I see green along all those lovely stair seating that aren't stair seatings. Um, I see uh, what do you call a year-round, what is it called, a year-round carpet. carpet, which I don't, I don't think that's, is that really what we're doing there? So unfortunately what you're seeing here is one slide in the planting deck. So what this slide is talking about is the larger perimeter of berms, so the areas that are shaded in green on this plan is what's been supported by the imagery on this page. And it really is a simplification of what's there. Um, so the, the ground plane is going to be the image in the top right, which is the, the carex. And then associated with the southeast, the southwest, and the northwest diagonal entrances, there'll be an enrichment of the planting either side of that walkway. And um, that's where you bring in some of the stilby, the lorabi, some of the seasonal things like the snowdrops, as well as the, the puppies. And the puppies actually stand, extend beyond that into the larger context of the, the carpet. So that tells the story of the, the perimeter. And then when it comes to the western terrace and the southern terrace, where these planters are integrated into the stairs, it's against the simplification of the palette. We're still using the same tree that's there. We're going from three trees to one tree because we want the soil volume to support that tree. And then we're also in a simple ground plane, which is a grass. So again, it's, it's a simplification of the palette. Um, but unfortunately, the image that you're seeing right now is just for one of these areas. OK. Um. 
And then while you're up, so this the, the entrance on the uh, southwest southwest side, right there. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, is what is that? Is it is it stairs? Is it what is that? Yes. So, the southwest is stairs. Um, as as they exist today. As they exist today. As they, yes, we have not changed the configuration of the stairs on the southwest or the southeast. They remain as are, but we are modifying the bottom forty five degree angle okay. curbs to six to. Uh, okay, but those stairs are friendly and and, and are easily walkable and, yeah. and yes. okay. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Commissioner Cash. Actually, uh, straight on this slide, and to your point. Um, so, I mean, I work in the Wilson building. I look at that south berm every day, and if you go out there right now, I mean, it's a little bit brown right now, but I mean, just throughout the year, it's a big, green, monolithic berm that you look at all the time. And I, uh, so I do think that, that some of these plantings, the, the landscaping elements, and even seeing in this picture, it breaks it up a little bit. Just by having the carpet, I think, will just be better than what's right now. It looks like a golf course like manicured grass out there and some trees. And I think that by just introducing something that's a little bit more interesting really breaks up the area and it makes it look less like a giant levee that's, because I mean, I, looking from the south side all the time, it just looks like a giant levee there and you can't even see it at the park. So I think anything you can do to have something more interesting with the plantings will really kind of break up um, and, and make the area a little bit more inviting because really coming from there from the south side right now, I mean, it's... it's <coughs> really dull so and i think that they're getting some other plants in there too like the poppies especially i think that that you have an opportunity kind of with that that uh memorial aspect with with having um something that, that evokes world war one so all right i think um understanding no additional comments I, I wonder if there's a motion to approve the preliminary site development plans for this world war one memorial so moved uh, do we have a second second Thank you. Um, all those in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Um, that covers our action items. And thank you very much for the work and appreciate the uh, <coughs> further input that you've given us here. Um, that covers our action items. And now we have two information presentations. The first is a presentation on the Baltimore Washington Superconducting Maglev project. You may want to listen to this. This is why leave. You got this is exciting stuff. Just kidding. Um, uh, Michael Weil uh, will introduce the project, and then Brandon Bratcher from the Federal Railroad Administration and Kelly Lyles from the Maryland Mass Transit Administration will provide the update. Welcome to all. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. Uh, representatives are here today from the United States Federal Railroad Administration, Maryland Mass Transit Administration, and the consultant team uh, to brief you on the Baltimore Washington Magnetic Levitation Study, which is being led by the Federal uh, Railroad Administration. As context, the planned future maglev uh, railway facility will connect downtown Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, Maryland, which may ultimately become uh, part of a larger line uh, extending up to New York City, as shown here in this slide. Two other ongoing studies to note based on their proximity to the Maglev project are, first, Amtrak's Northeast Corridor Initiative, which consists of a series of planned improvements between Washington and Boston to enable higher speed railway service. And these improvements are currently underway with full implementation uh, dependent upon funding. The second project is the Hyperloop, which is uh, Elon Musk's effort to construct an underground Hyperloop tunnel below the BW Parkway for high-speed travel between Washington uh, and Baltimore. And my understanding is that this project is still undergoing NEPA review by the Federal uh, Highway Administration. Um, but our next speaker, Brandon, will, uh, can address the relationship uh, between Maglev and these other projects uh, later on as part of his presentation. The future maglev may require land from a number of federal properties, uh, including the Baltimore Washington Parkway, Beltsville Agricultural Research Center, uh, United States uh, Secret Services Rally Training Center, and NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Mm -hmm. As part of our ongoing coordination with the project team, NCPC uh, staff has highlighted several key uh, federal planning interests, including the project's consistency with NCPC and National Park Service planning policies, 
potential impacts to the historic setting of the BW Parkway, tree removal, lighting, and how these impacts will be addressed through mitigation. As the project is funded and designed, our commission would review several sections of the maglev as it crosses over federal properties within the National Capital Region, as well as any related development within Stream Valley Parks uh, acquired under the 1930 Capra Crampton Act. As you can see, there are a number of federal and district agencies participating in the project's ongoing NEPA study process, with the Federal Railroad Administration serving as the lead agency, uh, working with NCPC, DC Office of Planning, Commission of Fine Arts, and the National Park Service. And with that, I will now turn the presentation over to, to uh, Brandon Bratcher, who is an environmental protection specialist with the Federal Railroad Administration and currently serving uh, as one of the project study managers. And he will now walk you through uh, the remainder of the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Again, my name is Brandon Bratcher. I'm an environmental planner with the uh, Federal Railroad Administration. We are the lead agency for this particular environmental study. Um, with me today, I also have other members of the team, um, represented uh, the Baltimore Washington Rapid Rail, which is the private company that is proposing this. We also have folks from uh, MDOT, Maryland Department of Transportation, uh, as well as contractor support from AECOM uh, and Booz Allen to help with any technical questions that may arise. So um, I'll try to quickly, just at a 30,000 foot level, go over where we are in our particular study. Again, this is a National Environmental Policy Act study that's going on at this point. Um, this is a quick sort of uh, enumeration of the agenda here, uh, but without further ado, I'll just kind of jump in. Um, a little bit of background here. Um, this initiative actually stems uh, from way back in the 90s. There was a, an earmark, uh, I believe, uh, signed by President Clinton in the Safety Lou Act way back in the day um, uh, to study the feasibility of uh, magnetic levitation technology in the United States. Um, there were previous efforts. There was a 2003 study um, which examined German technology. This study is a little different in that it is superconducting maglev, uh, which um, comes from the Japanese technology. So it's a slightly different study. The 2003 study did not end in a record of decision. Um, it, uh, there was a DEIS, but there was never uh, any movement beyond that. So um, this is just a little bit more uh, enumerated information about all of that. Um, current project it, yeah, utilizes Japanese uh, technology as opposed to German. Um, yeah, so I think that's all that I just said there. Project funding. Um, it's important to note that at this particular juncture, there's no construction funding necessarily set aside. Um, there are some loose um, promises of uh, funding from the Japanese government, uh, Japan Central Railroad, et cetera. But this particular initiative at this point is a $27.8 million grant. Um, again, MDOT is the grantee. Um, and we will be uh, initiating uh, the NEPA process um, and all the way up to about 30% engineering. Um, and um, I think there's more of uh, schedule uh, specifics coming up but just uh, telegraph uh, where we are in the process. The NOI, uh, the Notice of Intent for the Environmental Impact Statement was published back in 2016. Um, and at this juncture, Federal Railroad Administration is mulling over um, internally um, the preferred alternative. We have not made that decision yet. Um, we uh, will be making that probably in the next couple of months internally. Um, all right. so. Uh, let's go to the next. What is maglev? Of course, uh, obviously it's magnetic levitation. Uh, this is a little bit of a slide that talks about the technology. Um, this is a technology, this is a system that is propelled as well as decelerated by magnets. Um, we, the technology as it uh, is right now, um, we're going toward a, a cruising speed of around 500 kilometers per hour, which is 311 miles per hour. Um, there are specific, there's specific language in both the earmark as well as the 
the grant and uh, subsequent documentation uh, that we want to achieve the highest practicable speed possible as a demonstration of the technology. Um, and we have uh, agreed on that being around 500 kilometers per hour. So that kind of colors our alignments and the universe of possible solutions. Uh, and we'll get into that in just a second. Um, the, the system as it functions, uh, it kind of floats on a cushion of air. Uh, and uh, there, are no, there are wheels on the system, but they're only used whenever it's coming into the station uh, and leaving the station. Otherwise, it sort of acts um, like a, almost like an aircraft, but just a couple of feet off ground at most. So um, again, um, 311 miles an hour is, is a, a speed to keep in your mind. All right, and this, these next couple of slides just kind of go through uh, what we've enumerated as the project purpose and need. We had um, internal discussions with the project team, with FRA, et cetera, for a few months um, to go over the exact purpose and need. As you guys are aware, the purpose and need is a very important <coughs> part of a NEPA study. It sort of um, sets the groundwork for how you're going to study uh, moving forward. So uh, this is a, there's a lot of bullets in here that are just fancy ways of saying that uh, the need for the project stems from the fact that there's a lot of congestion in the DMV, and we're looking at ways to try to um, alleviate some of that. Um, there is also a bullet point in here about maintaining economic vitality, um, viability. Uh, again, the earmark has specific language about it being a revenue-producing system um, and about studying the feasibility from an economic standpoint. All right, again, this is just another way to say that uh, we want to reduce travel time. <laughs> uh, there's the highest practical speed language in there. Um, again, we'll get into that whenever we talk about the alignments. Whenever you're operating at 500 kilometers per hour, of course, that means uh, less curvature. The more you curve at that speed, the more uncomfortable it becomes. So we'll get into that in a bit. Um, this is uh, the original project study area that we enumerated a year or so ago. Uh, obviously, it includes a, a big chunk. Uh, we're talking about a 30-mile corridor here between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. Uh, includes parts of Baltimore County, Baltimore City, Anne Arundel County, uh, Prince George's County, as well as the district. All right, and this is the initial alignments, just to kind of tell you the initial um, universe of possibilities that we set out there. There were 14 uh, lines, sort of spaghetti graphs that we put out there at the very beginning of the study. Um, and they, a lot of them, some of them were along the WBNA trail, which is a, a, a walking trail uh, in Prince George's and Anne Arundel County. Some of them were to the west, or I'm sorry, to the east of Patuxent. Um, but the ones that have remained at this particular point, there are three alternatives that are still on the table. Um, one is a no action alternative, obviously. The other two are alignments. We have a J1 alignment, which is to the west of the Baltimore-Washington Parkway. And we have a, a J alignment, which is to the east of the parkway. Um, of note, uh, and forgive me, I don't know how much detail we get into in the, in the following but uh, close to 80% of the alignment, as it is currently uh, proposed, is underground. And in fact, uh, the entirety of both cities um, are underground, the DC and, and Baltimore. Um, the part where it would be above ground uh, is a part uh, basically along the southern end of uh, the Baltimore-Washington Parkway. 17 total miles, um, yeah, four miles above ground within the NCR. All right, yeah, so this is a, a typical uh, cross-section. On the left there, you see what the tunnel would look like. Um, and on the right is the guideway. Um, Biduct guideway will be 25 to 90 feet above grade. Uh, we just had a, a workshop about the alignment internally earlier this week, where we, uh, we saw some of those uh, illustrative drawings. So we're not ready to share those just yet. Um, tunneling um, will be an average of 50 to 120 feet below. Obviously, it'll be less uh, toward the portals where it, it dives underground and comes back above. All right, here's a photo of uh, an operating maglev system. Uh, this is from Japan, I believe. Um, it's important to note, as Michael uh, enumerated, there are other uh, systems that are studying this particular corridor. 
Um, Maglev uh, actually has uh, systems that are already running as opposed to Hyperloop. Hyperloop is testing systems at this particular moment. So that's an important distinction that we see among those two particular uh, systems. All right, so getting into the sort of the meat and potatoes of what this means for DC, um, there are going to be three stations along this alignment between DC and Baltimore. One will be in the city of Washington, one will be in the city of Baltimore, and one will be uh, in the middle at BWI. There are two station options that we're currently looking at for Washington, DC. They both center around the Mount Vernon Square area. This is uh, an illustration of the Mount Vernon Square East station, um, which uh, would be uh, obviously to the east and goes up New York Avenue toward 395. And you have a little bit of a typical um, underground uh, uh, illustration of what the platforms would look like. Yeah, you see there, there's a concourse, there's platforms, uh, et cetera. And we're talking a pretty substantial, we're 41 meters underground in some parts here. So I believe this is um, a lot of cut and cover construction, but I will defer to the engineers if there are further questions on that down the road. All right, so this is the Mount Vernon West concept, which is even deeper because um, we have to dive to avoid uh, buildings and obviously things in that area as opposed to the, the eastern uh, alignment, the eastern uh, Mount Vernon option um, is a little bit wider of, a, of, a, of alignment. We can accommodate a little bit more. <coughs> But you can see here, and I, I'm sorry, I can't see uh, in detail, but the, the east, I'm sorry, the west uh, option is a lot deeper than the, than the east option. And again, these, we haven't decided which one of these we're going toward, we're weighing at this moment. All right, so it's, uh, there are a lot of ancillary structures that come with this particular uh, system as well. We're talking about vent plants, substations, um, there's also um, uh, basically a train uh, storage lot. Um, we're calling it Rolling Stock Depot. There are a couple of different names floating around for it, but that would be over uh, 100 acres. And all of these things need to happen along the alignment. So this is just to let you know that there, in addition to the 30 to 40 mile alignment, there are um, substantial ancillary structures as well that would be along here. All right, again, just to reiterate where we are in the process, um, we're looking to have the DEIS, the Draft Environmental Impact Statement, out uh, this fall with a public hearing uh, in around October. Um, you see up there that we're looking to do a combined final environmental impact statement and record of decision uh, next year. Um, and the question that this sort of begs, I think, is what's the earliest that this could happen? Um, if we do get the record of decision signed next year, um, the construction, I think, would take somewhere around seven years, but we'd have to get construction funding secured before that. So in a perfect world, if construction funding is allocated next year, then we're looking at 2027 at the earliest for this system to be up and running. All right, and this is just, um, we have an agency coordination plan. Michael alluded to the fact that we have over 30 cooperating and participating agencies, as well as a whole slew of consulting parties. Um, it's a, a pretty large system and a pretty large um, group of folks who are looking at this particular study. So we have uh, FAQs updated on the website. We try to keep those as updated as we can. We get a lot of public comments and questions. Uh, the website's bwmaglev.info. And in terms of outreach, um, we did have a round of public open houses in October 2017. Um, we also had an open house in Baltimore last month, or I'm sorry, two months ago. Um, to go over uh, a train station option, or I'm sorry, a train depot option up there. Um, but we are in process of coordinating with DC planning and various other DC agencies to try to engage the ANCs as we move toward uh, the draft environmental impact statement in the fall. We also will have public hearings as is required uh, after the DEIS is out. Um, and those will be, you know, will represent both cities, DC and Baltimore, as well as the suburban communities, which have been pretty vocal about this project as well. All right, so again, this just uh, summarizes what I just said. Um, uh, and with that, I will open up to any comments or questions. Uh, of course, I have a dumb question. 
Um, okay. Oh, you're good. Because, I, you know, when you, the fastest train I've ever been on is in Europe, and your ears are popping, and and that can't be as fast as this. How does how do you control for uh, uh, interior environments for that? I mean, it's this is a dumb question, right? The same way you pressurize a cabin in an airplane or something. Um, yeah, I think I'll defer to Lewis Berger, who is the engineering. Maybe they can speak a little bit more about that. I have personally seen videos where there are folks on there, and they 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 talk about the the fact that it seems like it's lifting off at the beginning. But I'll. Mark Berger, uh, do you have anything to add to her question? I mean, it, it's already operating in, uh, in in Japan, so they've right. already designed so it to make Somebody knows how to do it. They've, right. we've, they've sent over contingents of folks from this country to test it out, and they all have smiles on their faces. They're very happy <laughs> when they finish their, their ride. So I, I, I mean, I'm not an engineer in that level, only the conceptual design, but I'm sure they've figured out all those nuances of air pressure and comfort. And I believe you can even walk around the train while it is going 311 miles per hour. So it's not such a dumb question, then? Right. right, and if I mean you guys, it's not just rolling off your tongue. You were the only one that thought it was a dumb. Well, question. Well, it is kind of a dumb question because no, obviously it yeah. it works. I just am yeah. curious about how because uh, I was struck by the the um, that I, I that I obviously know altitude does it, but speed mm -hmm. I didn't know before I was on a train that was going I don't even know how many miles an hour in Europe, but it was a ear popping escapade and I was just wondering how they mediate, mitigate that but they must and we'll I'll look it up sometime. I heard it smooths out the wrinkles in your yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay Commissioner Cash <laughs> so I have a question about the um, the, the terminus here in DC so I mean the first thing that strikes me is that it's not going to be co-located with Union Station, which is what we normally think of as rail and bus and all the other interconnectivity here. And I understand that there's probably some logistical reasons that you can't go around and because there's the Union Station expansion going on and that's Amtrak show and this wouldn't be Amtrak. Um, so my question is in, in, in Japan or in other places where, where these kinds of new technology have been implemented, is it common that this kind of, that a new station has to be built maybe far away from the other like major stations that they have for other transit modes and, and to have a distance between them? Does the interoperability matter because this would essentially be competing maybe with Amtrak and, and others? So what's the experience like there when, you, when you're not connecting it to our major rail hub that we already have? Yeah, um, I may defer to uh, Baltimore Washington Rapid Rail in terms of what's already in Japan, um, but I will tell you that in terms of Washington Union Station, obviously the Federal Railroad Administration very intimately acquainted with that particular facility, um, and the expansion going on there is part of the reason why. Um, in fact, at one point there was a NOMA station option that was on the table, uh, and we've talked to DC Planning about that. Um, one of the screening criteria for our particular study was that we minimize interaction with other existing railroads. Um, so that was uh, part of the reasoning behind that, as well as um, the ongoing Union Station redevelopment plan kind of doesn't really uh, involve a lot of room for additional um, train capacity, for it, especially for um, what Amtrak may consider as a competitor. Does in BWRR, do you guys have any sort of insight as to what sort of station connectivity you have in Japan? Well, that, that really does answer my question. I mean, it sounds like it's actually more of a feature than a bug because there, part of the study has to be that it doesn't compete with, with the existing. Right, yeah, yep. Mr. Trueblood. Thank you. Um, I, I guess to that point, is is part of uh, you do, uh, how do I put this? Part of your analysis include an impact on on Amtrak uh, ridership and and how that impacts their projections and their work. So uh, part of the analysis, part of the DEIS, will include uh, obviously there's an indirect and cumulative effects uh, assessment. Uh, Amtrak initially was invited uh, to be a, a consulting party or a cooperating agency. Obviously, they're they're semi-private, so uh, they can't function in that way. And they have been pretty vocal in um, submitting comments that way. Uh, the ridership question, to be completely honest, for uh, P3s, public-private. Um, partnerships is a little bit of a, 
a question that's still being kind of ironed out. Um, the, there is a ridership study that has been done for this particular uh, system. Um, I am not a ridership expert, so I can't really speak to that. And in fact, a lot of it is um, proprietary information. Um, I will just add that part of the stipulation of this particular grant is that it be revenue producing. Um, Amtrak has been very vocal about noting the, the possibility of competition, um, but FRA continues to um, push Amtrak initiatives as well. In fact, the NEC Future um, Environmental Impact Statement and Record of Decision was published about a year ago. Um, and uh, it, there's no, we don't see them as being uh, mutually exclusive of each other. They're kind of parallel spines. So um, I'm going to keep OP is a consulting party, as you mentioned, so I'm not going to get into all of our, our, our comments, but I will just, for the record, state that we are, um, we, uh, we, yeah, I think we have questions, obviously, about this, that we've talked about, about this um, station configuration. I think it requires um, thinking very differently the, about how we do stations. Um, you know, in the Macmillan Commission uh, encouraged the consolidation of, of our rail uh, into Union Station, and that has worked well for the last 100 years. Um, in addition, there are parking facilities and other facilities. There's bus facilities, intercity inter and intracity bus facilities. So I just, I think that is something that we will all have to wrap our heads around um, because this has n not really any of that. Um, and finally, uh, I guess it's worth saying that, you know, we've, as you mentioned, we are strongly encouraging kind of continual um, uh, community engagement on this one. Um, uh, you know, cut and covering New York Avenue uh, uh, yeah. is going to be, it'll be, it'll be interesting. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I mean, I think there's, you know, uh, there's, uh, as you mentioned uh, before, there was a, a NOMA option, uh, which would have been further out of the central city um, and maybe um, easier to connect with the union station. But, but here, here we are. So I just want to put those, I just want to kind of lay those comments out for you, which yeah. I think you probably know, but just yeah. for everybody else as well. And thank you for that. And, you know, as, you know, just someone who uses 395 and New York Avenue all the time, I understand the concerns. And I'll just add as a quick addendum, you know, I'm leaving this meeting to head to Georgetown, uh, my urban planning class, where I will be studying Mount Vernon Triangle for the next semester. So <laughs> I, I'm pretty familiar with what's going on around here. Wonderful. Yes, Commissioner Cash. Um, just on that note, I mean, it's great here now. You can get off and get a get an iPod and think different. Um, <laughs> yes. But actually, yeah, right. that, that question reminds me. So, if, if I'm recalling correctly, most of what we think of as New York Avenue, the farther out you get, where it kind of opens up, that's actually I think 595. It's actually designated as like a, a highway. And I think that one of the original plans was I was going to say, Mr. Trueblood has the transportation plan right there. I believe that at some point it was actually contemplated to cut and cover that and to make that a highway under. Is that one of the reasons this has to go so deep because there's other plans that could be taken off the shelf in 50 years when we decide we want to do that? Or is this not contemplating that New York Avenue facilities need would be needed for anything else in the future? I, like think I think part of the depth has to do with avoiding other utilities, but I will defer to Mr. Berger. Is there any other information to add? So if you've ever ridden the red line from DuPont Circle North, you notice that the train just continues in a straight line, yet it's going up, you know, the ground is changing above it. This is the same idea where they have to kind of find a line of a way to, you know, get through at a very little amount of up or down motion where you have a roller coaster effect. So you have a very little bit up, a very little down. So it's slowly adjusting itself out of the city. It's slow and it has to keep this in mind all the way up until it comes out of the portal at uh, north of Greenbelt. So that, that's kind of the, the reason for the depth. It's not that we're trying to be down. It's that it has to be a very slow adjustment. And we also have to consider the above ground, what's going on as far as up, up, you know, highs and lows, if that makes sense. But this would foreclose other opportunities to maybe do something with, with other transportation modes along the New York Avenue corridor, if this is under there. Uh, it's pretty deep. It's uh, it's going to be upwards of 100 to 200 feet at some instances. Uh, so I mean, there, there's a DC water is putting their their new line in. We're we're going way way underneath there. Uh, it, it's pretty. It's very deep. So there's there's still plenty of room if you wanted to do something on top. I, I think that it wouldn't be too much of a problem. And hmm. and for clarification, it's it's only cut and cover for I think a few blocks. Uh, the rest would be tunnel board. Mr. Dixon. Uh, uh, I guess, can you speculate what this might cost a rider? I mean, if you look at what's happening in Japan, the travel distances, what's, what's the ratio between this speed and a train or walking? 
<laughs> so um, that's a good question, and it, it comes up in every single public meeting that we have. I don't know if I can speak to that necessarily at this point. Um, our NEPA study hasn't really gotten there. Okay, but there must be a, there must be a ratio. I mean, you must in Japan it must cost so much for a high speed train and so much for maglev, and the difference is the delta would be a, a ratio, I would think, wouldn't it? Is that is that fair or not? Yeah, again, I'm not as familiar with the Japanese system, um, uh, and I believe that in terms of pedestrians, in terms of actual day-to-day um, -day use, that it's fairly new. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. If you can't, yeah. I understand, can't, understand what can't means, but it just seems to me you just figure it's got to be a difference, you know. Yeah, and we've, we've heard that. more than it is to ride a we've, normal train. We've heard that concern, and a lot of folks... Um, have uh, expressed concern about the price. Um, yeah. I, and I, mean, I, like to, I like to be able to use it, but I may not be able to afford to get on. I've, I've heard some assurances that would be comparable to an Amtrak ticket, okay. but I don't know for sure if that's been decided. And also, I understand that you have to go down. It seems to me that you ought to stay as deep as you can, as long as you can, because you don't want to have to have a new magic thing to get you up to back to back to earth again or back to the ground. We may have to have a high speed elevator to push you back up again. But at least you know that you're safe as long as you stay down and just keep drilling, and then you make them for the difference when you want to get off and you need to go up to the, to the surface level, right? And Japan and other countries do a lot with the space between the, the, the upper level and the uh, where the train comes in, shops and all kinds of stuff. So. I think there are some, you know, preliminary thoughts about trying to put in some sort of, you know, store level kind of things in between where the, the platform would be and the street. Yeah, it, it, it would, it would, rather than try to go up to get to a level that's higher because you want to enter in the city, a portal may stay just stay down and just get up on another mountain. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's yeah. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I, no, I, it's all good thoughts. Um, again, at the end of this study, we'll be about 30 percent finished with engineering, so there'll still be more details to be ironed out as we move on. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Bretcher, Mr. Berker. We appreciate the feedback. Uh, this is obviously something we're all jazzed about. It's something we've all dreamt of, and you're, you're, you're helping us envision that this could become reality in our lifetime. So that's very exciting. Thank we're you. We're very motivated. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, we'll hear a presentation on the proposed National Native American Veterans Memorial. Several of the commissioners had the opportunity today to visit the proposed site for this memorial on the grounds of the National Museum of the American Indian. I'd like to thank the Smithsonian representatives and members of the memorial team for providing an excellent and informative visit from what I've heard. So with that, uh, Ms. Vivian Lee will introduce the project. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Good afternoon, uh, members of the Commission. Following our site visit this morning, Smithsonian Institution will provide an information presentation on the National Native American Veterans Memorial. I'm going to provide a brief introduction before I turn the presentation over to Kevin Gover, who is the director of the National Museum of the American Indian. In 1994, Congress passed the Native American Veterans Memorial Establishment Act. The purpose of the memorial is to give all Americans the opportunity to learn of the proud and courageous tradition of service of Native Americans in the armed forces of the United States. This legislation authorized the Smithsonian to build and maintain a memorial inside the National <coughs> Museum of the American Indian, hold a competition to select the design, and grant approval of the selected design to the Smithsonian's Board of Regents. Congress amended the act in 2013 to allow the museum to be located outside of the Museum of the National um, Memorial American of the, sorry. Okay, so Congress amended the act in 2013 to allow the memorial to be located outside of the museum as determined by the Smithsonian. Due to these unique provisions, the memorial is not subject to the Commemorative Works Act. The Smithsonian's Board of Regents has approval authority for the design and location of the memorial per, per the Congressional Act. 
NCPC does not have review authority for the design and location of the memorial. However, any related improvements that change the previously approved site plan, such as access to the memorial, changes to the landscape, will require NCPC approval under the National Capital Planning Act. The museum is located in southwest Washington, D.C., along the National Mall and near the U.S. Capitol. Institutional and office uses surround the project site, including the National Gallery of Art to the north across the National Mall, the Botanic Gardens to the east, the National Air and Space Museum to the west, and the Cohen Building to the south. Here is a closer look at the site. The museum is bound by Jefferson Drive to the north, Third Street to the east, Maryland and Independence Avenues to the south, and Fourth Street to the west. The memorial will be located on the northeast portion of the museum grounds near the corner of Jefferson Drive and 3rd Street. Commission approved the final site and building plans for the National Museum of the American Indian in 2000. The museum was completed in 2004. The picture on the left shows the building's curvilinear form and natural materials which resemble rock formations found in the North American landscape. The picture on the right shows the museum's main entrance, which faces east towards the rising sun and the U.S. Capitol. The museum grounds has a very robust landscape with more than 27,000 <coughs> trees, shrubs, and plants. So the purpose of this information presentation is to introduce the memorial and provide commission members with the opportunity to comment on the memorial location and design to inform the concept submission. We anticipate that the concept design will come before the commission in May and the final design during the summer. The memorial will be dedicated on Veterans Day 2020. So with that, I will, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Gover and the design team to continue the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, my name is Kevin Gover. I'm the director of the National Museum of the American Indian. So as you saw, we were assigned this project originally in 1994. There were some challenges uh, that uh, in the uh, conditions that Congress laid down for us at that time. Um, <coughs> shortly after I uh, became director of the museum, uh, Congress revisited the statute, um, authorized us to build a, uh, the memorial outside of, uh, outside of the museum. But also, there was a, a curious provision in the original statute that said we could not use federal funds, nor will we be allowed to raise other funds. And uh, we couldn't think of any other kind of, uh, of money. So, uh, but Congress, uh, to its credit, has uh, solved that problem for us. Um, I don't want to go into, give you the, the whole, the whole uh, history of Native American veterans. Suffice it to say, uh, Native Americans have served in the American Armed Forces in every conflict, uh, beginning with the Revolution, up to and including uh, the war on terrorism today. Um, in the 20th century, Native Americans served uh, at a higher rate per capita than any other group in the United States. Uh, service in, uh, in, in the American Armed Forces has become embedded in Native American cultures across the country. Um, almost every tribal uh, event uh, involves in some way the honoring of veterans uh, to acknowledge their service. And so uh, we took care uh, from the beginning to reach out to the tribal communities and especially the Native American veterans uh, to ask their thoughts on what this memorial is about. Uh, we spent about a year and a half doing 35 separate uh, meetings throughout the country, uh, including in Alaska and Hawaii. Um, happily, the uh, feedback that we were getting from the veterans was very consistent. Uh, they wanted, for example, uh, both men and women honored. They wanted all eras of service honored. They wanted all five of the armed services honored. And so, and, and above all, they wanted a design that was truly inclusive of all cultures. They didn't want it to reflect uh, a particular native culture, but try to find uh, uh, iconography and design that uh, really does reflect uh, universal Native American values, which is no small challenge. Um, 
We then, uh, uh, in accordance with the terms of the statute, conducted a design competition. Uh, that competition began uh, in November. I always get the year wrong. It was November of 17. Um, in January of 18, we received 120 uh, completed design proposals. Um, this was a blind competition at that point. Uh, our jury met and uh, came up with five finalists for further, for further development. The, uh, those five um, groups uh, then submitted further refined designs. We um, brought our jury back together and they unanimously selected uh, a design <coughs> Oops. A design by um, a gentleman named Harvey Pratt, who's here with us today, and I'll call on him in just a second. Um, Harvey is a citizen of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes. He's a working artist. He has a career law enforcement um, officer, and uh, he is a Vietnam veteran and a Marine. So Harvey's pretty much from, from central casting for us, <laughs> for, uh, for the guy that we wanted uh, to be the designer uh, of this memorial. And so uh, let me call on Harvey, and, and he can talk a bit about his, uh, his design concept. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, like I said, my name is Harvey Pratt. I'm a Cheyenne, Southern Cheyenne Peace Chief. I have been for one for 20 years. I'm a veteran of the Vietnam, uh, served in the Marine Corps as a reconnaissance uh, platoon. Uh, I spent 50 years in law enforcement. Uh, graduate of the FBI National Academy, and uh, I uh, submitted my design uh, since we had to encompass 570 some federally recognized tribes. I uh, I didn't want to do a statue. I wanted to do something that people could walk into, like ceremonial people. They go into a certain area, and I, that's what I wanted to do. So, my design was based on uh, uh, the Warrior Circle of Honor. Uh, 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 horizontal circles and vertical circle that people that walk the red road, native people could come into that area that, uh, you know, native people were, were, uh, were the same, but were different. <coughs> we're the same, but we're different. We have our own little special ways of doing things. And, and that's what I wanted to incorporate the elements, the water, the fire, the earth, and, uh, the air. And so that is a very integral part, is the elements. And then the directions, uh, the directions that power comes from, the north, east, south, and west, and up and down, the six directions. And so we, we all pay, almost all tribes use those things. And we use the cardinal points. And, and we use uh, prayer cloths. And, and we ask people to come in here. And, and my idea and my hope was that, that Native people would come here and honor their their veterans and honor those that have passed and those that are present and those that are to come, their grandchildren. And it will be endless. This circles are, is an endless thing and, and, it's, and it's happening all the time. And we pay, people, Native people pay attention to the circles. And, and uh, so those were my concepts and ideas and that's how I tried to manipulate and put them all together so that when people came in there, Native people would recognize those things and they would use them in their own special way, their own different way. Uh, that we use the water, and they would they would uh, use the earth and and the air, and and the fire, and the fire is is in the very center of the circle, and and uh, it's a, it's about 50 feet across and 14 to 15 foot high, and uh, the circle actually is the hole in the sky where the Creator lives. So what I want people to do is is to come in there and walk the red road and come into harmony not only with themselves, but with the Creator and the earth and the elements. And that's what, that's what native people do of all, of all nations. And, and uh, that was my concept of, of my design. And I had, uh, had, uh, would like to introduce uh, Hans Bootser, who is uh, the uh, design architect. And he is going to tell you about uh, our placement and site. And uh, Hans is, uh, is a, uh, uh, has his company in Oklahoma City, uh, Bootser urbanism and architecture, and, and he is the designer of the Murrah Building bombing uh, in Oklahoma City. Him and his wife, Tori, designed that. He is the Dean of Architecture at the University of Oklahoma, and he is the award winner AIA uh, for the Thomas Jefferson Award for Public Art. Uh, and so I would like to introduce you to Hans so that he may speak with you. 
Thank you all very much. So we'd like to orient you to the uh, proposed site location, uh, beginning with uh, photographs of the existing site. Uh, certainly here we see it deep in the beauty of, of winter here in Washington, D.C. Uh, to the upper left, uh, you see a view looking southwards, uh, down third. Number two, looking southwest from the corner back <coughs> towards NMAI. And number three in that upper right image, looking due west down Jefferson. And to your right there, you can envision there the National Mall. The lower left image is a view uh, effectively from the northeastern edge of the constructed wetlands looking northeast. Uh, Congress, uh, the U.S. Capitol building is just off to the right. Lower middle, uh, this beautiful view from the corner kind of peeping through uh, towards the incredible uh, welcoming circle in front porch of NMII. And there in the lower right, again, you see that uh, collection of uh, photos as they view in that northeastern corner where we propose the location. As you start to zoom a little bit more in and enter the NMAI grounds, uh, just to the north uh, of the welcoming circle in the main entry for NMAI, looking north, you see in that upper left image, there's a congruence of uh, so-called grandfather rocks, and they help shelter uh, this beautiful uh, space, the Daniel Inoue uh, prayer circle that's in the upper middle image. And it's in that uh, location where we propose you first begin to take the path, the approach towards the proposed memorial site. From the welcoming circle, an image in the upper right is, would be a, this beautiful expansive view across these constructed wetlands looking northeast towards the proposed site. You see the wetlands in the foreground. Uh, through the trees just off to the right is the Capitol Dome. And in the lower left is a view from effectively entry of NMAI across the welcoming circle towards the proposed site. And then lastly, in that lower middle, you know, this kind of sweeping view from the south, so from Maryland, uh, past the entry on the left to NMAI, looking towards those grandfather rocks where you would first begin your approach towards the memorial site itself. So in terms of overall uh, orientation, you know, the primary entrance uh, to the National Museum of American Indian is off uh, on the eastern edge, immediately after that, that large circular plaza, um, off on the eastern edge. Uh, those are actually where the formal doors are. But really, the preponderance of, of visitors approaching the NMAI come from that northwestern corner off of the National Mall there at 4th and Jefferson. And they come in along the northern edge of the museum, what we call the River Walk. And it's along there that you have certain uh, cultural sites and that take you to the welcoming circle on that eastern edge. And on the southern uh, facade of the uh, Museum is a secondary entrance, almost more of a secure entrance uh, off of Maryland and Independence. When we really start to zoom in, uh, as was previously mentioned, the, the quality of the vegetation, the nature of the vegetation the site is really important to the kind of interpretive aspects uh, of the uh, museum itself and situating it within the region. Um, you can see here in the, the key, the dark green, uh, speaks to this upland hardwood forest uh, vegetation. It's much taller, it's lush, it's green. Um, over on the east is again this constructed wetland. Again, this is not a natural wetland of any sort. It's effectively, it's a water feature. And then on the southern edges of the museum site is what we call the eastern meadowland. There you have much more open, it's grasses, um, and uh, far more kind of sweeping, if you will, and, and certainly gold in color. And then in terms of site programming, uh, on the far western edge along 4th are the loading docks. So they're kind of uh, you know, much more discreet as they tuck down and underneath. Uh, along the south, again, as we mentioned before, is more interpretive. It's what we call the uh, market plaza. The northern edge, as people enter more formally from the northwestern corner of the site, they move along the river walk, uh, past the dance circle and amphitheater and move in uh, towards the so-called welcoming circle on that bold eastern edge of the site. And it's from here where we propose uh, that uh, walking approach through the, uh, the forest 
along the northern edges of the wetlands to the actual proposed memorial site. Here you begin to see uh, there's an overlay in the northeastern corner uh, of the, the approximate approach and the memorial circle as it's nested in the existing topography. You do get a lot of drop from the uh, perimeter of the site down towards the constructed wetlands. This is the uh, first preliminary site plan uh, that we were bringing forth. Uh, really, a, a most primary focus is the actual placement of what we're calling the Warriors Circle of Honor. Uh, the approach itself is very important. You see there the grandfather rocks as that threshold from the welcoming circle in Riverwalk towards that uh, approach. Harvey, do you want to say just a, a little bit about the Red Road? Uh, as we come in from the Grandfather Rocks, we, that's the path that all natives walk is called, referred to as a Red Road. Uh, as it approaches uh, the memorial, uh, the inner circle of the memorial is Harmony, where, that, where they walk, all walk the Red Road and they come into harmony with nature and with themselves and with the Creator. And you can see here from this uh, conceptual site plan, uh, the, uh, the way we have uh, inscribed the four cardinal points, they're part of that perimeter circle of seating. Um, those are really important to helping situate in the uh, X, Y, and Z directions uh, this very important memorial. And you can tell also from the approach, you know, there will be this, you know, really interesting play, you know, on your left as you move towards the memorial. Your, your experience is really more about uh, being a part of the lowlands forest and on the right to the south is much more open, these beautiful vistas across the constructed wetland. This is a section diagram that gives you a sense of scale and situation of the proposed memorial. Uh, down there in the lower left, the Warrior Circle of Honor hovers just above uh, the constructed wetlands, again nested uh, amidst the uh, trees. And you can begin to uh, visualize a little bit of what that approach would be as you move through uh, the wooded uh, scape. This also gives you a good sense of how the uh, proposed warrior circle is kind of the smaller but important counterpoint uh, to this very impressive uh, uh, porch of the NMAI itself. <coughs> a little bit more close up, you begin to see the scale of the warrior circle. As Harvey mentioned, uh, the circle itself is approximately 12 feet in diameter uh, in this vertical direction. The overall diameter of the uh, flat plaza, if you will, uh, is approximately 50 feet. And we're very interested in creating you know, these different conditions, edge conditions, as you move through uh, on the north, on the left in this image, a little bit more of an engagement of the site and its topography, and then on the right, a little bit more about connecting the experience to the, the beautiful surface of the constructed wetlands. And now I'll take you through just a few uh, conceptual perspectives. Again, you reference back those original site photos that we shared with you. Uh, this is a view from uh, 3rd and Jefferson looking southwest. Uh, we propose kind of a strategic uh, clipping of the vegetation so they have these very focused uh, views, glimpses, if you will, um, back to the proposed memorial and the NMAI entryway. So in a lot of ways, the memorial is a foreground element that creates a sense of uh, spatial depth, but it also is a of course, a very, very important uh, focal place, a destination, if you will. <coughs> this is a view that gives you a sense of the relationship from the welcoming circle just outside the NMAI entry doors, looking across the constructed wetlands towards the memorial. Uh, one of the things that we think is, is advantageous to the, the sighting here is that you know, when there are uh, very sacred ceremonies, we anticipate there will be many, uh, that they'll be, you know, very uh, appropriately situated within the scale of the, the memorial space itself. But for much larger, you know, really s significant uh, celebrations, if you will, uh, what we appreciate here is the fact that, you know, kind of the overflow of, of people wanting to participate, witness, can stand here as part of the uh, welcoming circle and look across to these uh, ceremonies as they take place. This gives you a sense of approach as you move through the threshold of uh, the Grandfather Rocks. 
uh, the Daniel Inouye prayer circle is just off to the left there in that image. So this approach path kind of kisses the, east, the southern edge of that prayer circle and then takes you through uh, this beautiful path, again, through dappled, shaded light, forest on the left, uh, the open, constructed wetlands on the right. Um, we anticipate there being some type of uh, guardrail and so forth to, to kind of help navigate the public through uh, to keep people from falling into the water um, and leading them you know, to the uh, uh, memorial site itself beyond. So it's, and then this is the uh, final image. Uh, this is really what it's, you know, about arriving there at the site. You see this 12-foot uh, beautiful uh, warrior circle. We anticipate it being of this uh, reflective material that catches the glint of the sun. Uh, it is situated on a, a drum uh, that has flowing water that creates this beautiful cooling sound. Um, it kind of heightens the sensory experience of the place. The fire that Harvey mentioned before would be placed at the base of that ring. Uh, it would only be lit on very special occasions, so it's not something that's you know on all the time, but very, very, very discreet, very strategic. And when it's used, you see the benches that circumscribe uh, the perimeter of the more intimate portions of the uh, memorial space. And then on the outer perimeter, the red road that Harvey just referred to, it kind of mediates between the site itself and that uh, more intimate inner space. Ultimately, we're hoping to capture and make this a, a very sensory experience, right? You, again, you have the, the glint of the sun, you have the sounds of the water, um, the fire, the heat, the, the visual flickering of a flame. And you'll see there also these four lances that help accentuate the four cardinal points. But they serve as basically entry gates to the, the site, if you will. And very important is that we propose attaching these prayer cloths to the tips of these lances, help capture the sun and also capture the wind. So you have this kind of sound and this visual clue. So at the end of the day, this is very much a very sensory exper uh, experience intended to allow people from all walks of life, from all over the world, to come and honor those uh, who served. And we really believe that this is a very appropriate sighting for the National Native American Veterans Memorial. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, the inspiration of that. Are there any questions? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'd yeah. like to I'd just comment. I, oh, during my few years on this commission, uh, I can remember the presentation of this, of the, of the, of your, of your, 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 your building, your, your memorial building. And it was, it was, uh, emotional and spiritual in its presentation. The selection of the stones, the rocks, the material, the way it was designed. And I feel the same spiritual presentation, not just, I mean, I go, we go through a lot of presentations and they're very interesting, the art and the selection, and all, but the spiritual connection is not always there like I get with your presentations. And I just think it's special. Um, I also say this, as a official card-carrying tribal member from North Carolina, who also has an honorable discharge from the Air Force and the Army. I'm retired 06 in the Army. Uh, but I was certainly raised as a black American here in Washington, D.C. But my father always said, I'm an Indian. And I know he, he was right because we got all the paperwork finally done for my children and for me. So I say that with some uh, particular respect and appreciation for what you're trying to do. Uh, I also have to laugh because, you know, when I was as a Native, Native Washingtonian, I was one of the first people on the council when I chaired it to bring legislation forward to help fund and establish uh, a mechanism for bringing statehood to us, trying to fight for, as a Native, our Native community to have Native representation as we deserve and still don't have. And the two things that they did, once we did that legislation, this was the first effort, they blocked the money by saying you cannot use federal government or private funds to do this. <laughs> Something very similar goes with them. So I thank you for what you're doing, Touché. and particularly right now with all the energies that we hear that relate to, to, our, to the Native American community, to our community, the restrictions, the disrespect, et cetera, is just amazing. And thank you for this, and I'm looking forward to the going forward. Commissioner Cash. Uh, thanks so much for having us out this morning. I thought it was really great to see the site in person and gave a lot of context. 
Um, and I, I mentioned this briefly this morning, but I'll say it again here on the, the public record. I mean, I think that the design, all that is great. Uh, one of the things that struck me, and I had never really realized before about the accessibility of the site, um, the museum's really only accessible from the extreme northwest end and walking along the northern perimeter of it, or from the uh, southeast side where you come right into the welcome circle. Um, and here we're going to have the memorial that's in the extreme northeast section. So I think it's really worth in this early still design phase looking at seeing if there's some kind of connection that you can make closer, like closer to the northeast side of, of the site, not within the memorial itself, but maybe just a cut through above the amphitheater to get you out to the mall. Because I think that there's a lot of people that would otherwise want to come in here and experience this and will say, I have to walk a block and a half all the way down and cut back. So I think that, that to cut down on, on folks going through and appropriately and all that and really maximizing the accessibility of the site, uh, I think it'd be good to, to think of something, uh, an additional con uh, pedestrian connection there. Yeah. And we're certainly you know, keeping that in part of the car discussions. And then just a point of personal privilege, I actually used to work for Senator Akaka of Hawaii, and, um, and it was really great being out there and seeing the senator in a way uh, prayer circle, and given Senator Akaka's work in this and all that, I think it would be great if there could be some kind of little mention of his name or memorial element <laughs> that gets to, to make its way into, into the design as well as a, as a Native Hawaiian veteran on, on his part. I should have mentioned it in my presentation. It was Senator Akaka who held the, the oversight hearing asking me, um, why haven't you built the memorial? And uh, allowing me to make the record of the changes that needed to be made to the statute. He then introduced the legislation. Uh, it didn't pass uh, before his retirement, but Senator Schatz then picked it up along with uh, Congressman Mullen, who is a, a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. So uh, I would just emphasize that our, our objective here is to please the Native American veterans. Um, and uh, the ceremonial elements, are really the design is to accommodate the sort of ceremony that we will, we anticipate, uh, native native veterans and their families um, will want to engage in in honor of uh, of their service. So, we're um, we do think of it as um, I really didn't realize this when we started the project, um, but it became more and more clear to me that uh, um, this this acknowledgement is tremendously important to those veterans, um, and they do feel. Um, they do feel underappreciated by the world at large, even as they're honored very deeply in our communities. Mr. May. Um, yes, uh, thank you also for having us out there today. I'm glad I made it over, uh, even though I was running a bit late. Um, it was well worth it, even though I'd seen the site before. Um, and I um, would echo the comments of my fellow commissioners. Um, in uh, many ways, and uh, I, I am also thinking about that need for a potential connection along the north side because I think it would uh, um, it would it would it could help uh, quite a bit in uh, allowing or getting people to really appreciate what's there because I think you're uh, embarking on building a really wonderful thing. Um, the uh, other thing I would mention is that uh, um, you know having seen and some of the earlier um, iterations of site uh, or the, the earlier proposed location, which was very close to the prayer circle, um, I am really very, very happy with the relocation um, to the eastern side. Uh, <coughs> it does um, take up some of the area of the wetland. Um, it just feels so much more comfortable there. And uh, the experience of Walking the red road to get to it, I think, is going to be a very special thing, and it, and it, and it gives you this the sort of um, separation that you want, but the proximity of, you know, the visual proximity and in the setting that I think is really it's a, it, I, I was really quite impressed with how much uh, it has improved. Um, I do think it is very important to in that site for it to feel like it is um, nestled in because of the you know, all of what's around it, and that it not be so large that it kind of overpowers the wetland. So I think careful attention to make it just big enough and, and not any bigger. Um, and I don't know if that's where, you know, whether that's what it is right now or whether it should be just a little bit smaller. I'm used to telling people to make things smaller. Um, so, um, but I, I think careful examination of that is, uh, is vitally important. But overall, very, very happy. Um, to have been there, although uh, I have to say, the folks who clean 
the uh, NCPC chambers might not be so happy about the mud that I dragged in on my feet. <laughs> I just, just noticed a little pile under my chair here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think you really are feeling the warmth and receptivity to your, uh, your very sensitive thinking and design ideas, and we look forward to seeing this evolve. I did have one minor question. We're staring at this beautiful image, and I'm so captivated by the 12-foot diameter uh, oval. Um, and then it sits on an ov on a circle as well. Is that right? Are they are they dimensionally in the same universe there? The, is the unity between the 12 feet and the 12 feet re represented there? Or yeah. So the, the so the vertical ring is approximately 12 feet in uh -huh. diameter. The drum on yeah. which it's situated is a bit narrower, a bit a smaller, bit. and okay. all we're looking at there is just that the right sweet spot of people not hitting their head as they circumnavigate yeah, so the you circle. Extend the drum out to about ten foot, so you don't bump your head as you're walking around. And I notice there's a there's a channel around the drum at the base. Is that also to sort of uh, not have you cross that that sort of <laughs> small channel? Yeah, so the, the channel at the base is there to receive the water as it flows over the drum. OK. Great. OK. Yes. Ms. Sharago. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say, as my introduction to the commission, I had never, I had not been to a meeting. So this was the very first thing um, that I was able to do this morning was to come on the field trip. And I thought um, I was not only um, you know, moved and impressed by uh, by the design and the feel and just the overall environment. I'd been to the museum many times, but I'd never been out there and walked through the wetlands or whatever we did. And uh, and that was fun. But it was um, it was a it, it was impressive. I, I don't know how many times we take field trips, but I think this was I think it's so instructive. Um, especially with something like this, to to get the you know to have the feel from something other than a slide. So uh, it was lovely, and I have appreciated that opportunity. Well, we told you this was an exciting uh, <laughs> position, and see there you're already. So thank you, thank you very very much, and I think with that uh, this concludes our open session agenda. If there's no other business. Uh, the open session is now adjourned. Thank you. Oh.